Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. We're going to continue hearing evidence from Mr. Paul Hyatt. So perhaps you'd ask Mr. Hyatt to come in, please, would you? Good morning, Mr. Hyatt. Good morning. <coughs> Ready for another day's answering questions? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Right, Mr. Minute, off you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Hyatt. Good morning. Um, I want to turn back to the topic, please, of insulation and specifically Celatex RS5000. Could we please turn to CEL 50416? This is the rain screen cladding compliance guide, uh, which was published in February 2015. Uh, as I think you'll be able to see if we go to page five. If we can go to page five, um, you can see the date um, on that page. Page five, please. Uh, in fact, you can't, I think, quite, but it doesn't matter. It, it is actually dated that day. Now, go back to page one, please. If we can go back to page one, um, you can see that it is four, specifying Celatex RS5000 in buildings above 18 metres. Uh, and um, if you go to uh, page, the next page, page two, please. Uh, that uh, says at the very top, this document provides guidance on complying with approved document B2, ADB2, for external wall cladding systems fixed to steel frame or masonry constructions that provides a step-by-step -step guide to an alternative route to compliance for ADB B2, through meeting the performance criteria set out in BR135 through testing to BS8414-2002 or BS8414-2005. Um, just there, do you think that, in this respect, the guide has made a distinction between the linear route to compliance with ADB and the alternative route to compliance through meeting the performance criteria set out in BR135 uh, through a test, a full-scale test. I, I was thinking that, um, just as you were formulating the question, it isn't as clear as it should be. In what respect is it not as clear as it should be, do you think? Um, it provides a step-by-step -step guide to an alternative route to compliance for ADB2. Um, Document provides a guidance on command vehicle. I, I think I've got to read it twice or three times myself, and I still wouldn't get quite to grips with this. I think I'd be turning and asking for, for help. But um, um, perhaps I can try the question a different way. When looking at that, little paragraph I've just read to you, putting yourself in the shoes, uh, as you're, of course, asked to do so, of the reasonably competent architect. Uh, would the reasonably competent architect look at that and think to themselves, well, this compliance guide is telling me that the uh, um, product complies with approved document B2, that is but, so. but because it does so because uh, it, it meets the alternative route for compliance through meeting the performance criteria set out in BR135. Well, that was the way I took your question, and I took the question as, does it make it absolutely distinctly clear that it is the alternative route? I suppose it says alternative route there, actually. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and to put the question another way round, would the reasonably competent architect looking at that, if they did look at it, think to themselves, ah, well, uh, this is not a material which is of limited combustibility and therefore can be used uh, in satisfaction of the linear route to compliance? I don't know. Um, it's very difficult for me to answer this question. I think I would take comfort that this is telling me that it complies with ADB2. I don't know if I'd actually interrogated that further. Um, there's the compliance. Can we then go to page three? 
And on the right-hand side of that page towards the top, you can see a column uh, and three uh, bullet points or little arrows. And then underneath those arrows, it says the classification applies only to the system as tested and detailed in the classification report. The classification report can only cover the details of the system as tested. It cannot state what is not covered. When specifying or checking a system, it is important to check that the classification documents cover the end-use application. Yes, well, that's absolutely clear. I was going to ask you. That's absolutely clear, yes. is it? Right. The, may I just uh, make the point? The timing of all this, of course, is very late because this document was not available, I think, at the time that this product was first uh, proposed. That is, that is correct. So th this would, an, an architect who's adopted this product earlier on would not necessarily be revisiting the whole of this conversation. That, that, is, that is correct. But I want to, what I want to do okay. is to show you all three uh, pieces of manufacturer's literature on RS5000. This is the latest one we're starting with. You're absolutely right. Um, if we go to page um, four of this document, uh, again, it says in the right-hand column, uh, in the second paragraph, the fire performance and classification report issued only relates to the components detailed and constructed in figure four. Any changes to the components listed in construction methods set out in figure four will need to be considered by the building designer. And the figure four is set out below it, uh, and you can see the ingredients or the elements of the cladding system, which was tested uh, un under a BS8414. And if you look above uh, the diagram to the middle column, uh, there's a little um, heading. The system tested was as follows in bold. And you can see that there are six elements to that, uh, starting with 12 millimeter fiber cement panels. Just looking at that, um, again, from the perspective of the reasonably competent architect, is there anything misleading or unfairly presented uh, in uh, either in this page, either in the right-hand column or the left-hand column I've shown you, the middle column I've shown you? No, well, I've seen this before, and it's absolutely clear to me that this is not the arrangement into which the Celotex was put on the building, and that would be clear to an architect looking at this. Thank you. Now, let's next go, please, to CEL uh, 6013. This is the rain screen cladding specification guide, uh, also produced by Celotex, but this time in August 2014. It, excuse me, Mr. Minute. It would also be clear to an architect, even before reading that, that any test, any alternative route that involved a test, that test would have to be precisely as per the building. When you say the test would have to be precisely as per the building, do you mean that the elements yes, and the correct. design of the elements correct. hanging together correct. would have to be precisely as yes. proposed for the building? Yes, and any deviation from that requires specialist advice. Thank you. Now let's uh, look at this document. This is, as I say, dated August 2014. Um, it's called the Rain Screen Cladding Specification Guide, as you can see there. If we go to page five, please. Uh, we can see on the right-hand side uh, of the page, uh, uh, third paragraph down, that the fire performance and classification report for Celotex RS5000 only relates to the components detailed above. Any changes to the components listed will need to be considered by the building designer. And then if you look at uh, the left-hand side of the page, you can see uh, rather more information. Under fire performance in big red letters, uh, it says... Uh, rain screen insulation, Celotex RS5000 is class naught fire, related, fire rated as described by national building regulations. And then below that it says building above 18 meters, Celotex RS5000 has been successfully tested to BS84142 of 2005, fire performance of external cladding systems, test method, etc. Meets the criteria set out in BR135 and is therefore acceptable for use in buildings above 18 meters in height. And note the word therefore there. The system tested to be S84142 2005 was as follows. And there again, you've got the six elements of the test. Um, again, on that document, from the perspective of the reasonably competent architect, is there anything misleading or, or unfairly presented about uh, the use or potential use 
uh, of this material on a building above 18 meters? I think so. I, I, um, I've looked at this before, and the word therefore um, is a problem for me because um, the clear implication of that is that this product is okay for buildings of over 18 meters. It's then qualified by a specific test. I think the manuf I believe the manufacturers should make it abundantly clear that, that their product um, should be scrutinized with the greatest of care for use. This manufacturer should make it clear that this product should be scr uh, scrutinized with the greatest of care for situations over 18 meters. Um, I don't think it's as clear as it should be. Well, I note that. If I were to put Celotex's position to you, I would be saying to you that it is clear because uh, although it says uh, that it can be used above bu in buildings above 18 metres in height, it then goes on to make it clear in the right-hand column, as I've shown you, uh, that the fire performance and classification report only relates to the components detailed above. Any changes to the components listed will need to be considered by the building designer. And Celotex would ask, well, what's not clear about that? Well, it would be good if it said it, it uh, um, Celotex being successfully tested, da 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 da, da and is therefore acceptable for use in buildings above 80 meters in height, provided, and then it could be absolutely clear, provided. But there's no provided about this. I see. Uh, before we leave this document, can uh, I ask you to turn to uh, page uh, uh, well, stay on the same page uh, and actually look at the top left hand corner where it says in big red letters, Celotex RS5000 has been successfully tested to BS8414 to 2005 performance of external cladding systems. Just taking that on its own, if that's all you were to look at, given that that's been highlighted, is there anything unclear, incomplete, or potentially misleading about that? Um, no, um, but we're, we're certainly at the edges in all this. The, the moment that the product, the moment that the architect is departing from clear compliance with the linear route in ADB2, I think specialist advice is needed. Finally, can we look at CEL 401240, please? This is the Celotex RS5000 product data sheet, uh, and it's dated the 1st of August 2014. Um, first, can I just ask you to look, please, at the big pink banner at the head of page one, where yeah. it says, Celotex RS5000 premium rain screen cladding board, brackets, suitable for buildings above 18 metres in height, close bracket. Uh, what would a reasonably competent architect take from that? Well, that, that goes to the point I was um, making, perhaps not as eloquently as I should have earlier, which is that there's no qualification to this. And then if we and look so at... Uh, uh, I beg your pardon. So, so sorry, I, do, do continue. Mr. No, it's my fault. Um, I paused. There's no qualification to it, and so I think the, the architect can take comfort from it, um, may take comfort from it. Now, it can be argued that the architect should look further and harder, but I believe that Celotex, all manufacturers, have a duty, particularly in relation to issues like fire, to make sure that every assistance is given to those who will be specifying and making the right decisions, and this is clearly mis... I think that the, the potential here is for this to be misunderstood and manufacturers should not, um, sh should do their best to avoid that. Do you, do you think the uh, <coughs> competent architect would read this as if it said generally suitable, as opposed to suitable in specifically tested circumstances? No, I think generally suitable. Su suitable for buildings above 18 metres in height. So it's not, it's not qualified. I'd like to put it, if I may, into another context as well. I've mentioned in my report the dangers of condensing, I'd use the word crushing, decision-making into such a short time. When I began my career, this is not a history uh, lesson, but when I began my career, 
the process of developing a design and a, spe a specification was very orderly and took longer, or more time was given up front. We now have a situation through design and build where there is disorder. I made that clear in my report, where later stages can be done before earlier stages. The presumption would have been that they would have been done earlier. So an architect can end up in a situation where there's an immense crushing of time. And it's, it's uh, I'm, I've got to be careful the way I describe this, but sat here being presented with this, it's very easy to say, for, for me to think, yes, everything here should be read in a very orderly fashion. But if the architect's trying to deal with the interior of the building, trying to deal with the cladding, trying to deal with a range of components going into the cladding, there's sudden late changes coming in from the design build contractor, then there will be limited amount of time that can be spent. And it's for that reason it's very important, I think, that the design team are assisted by the those who certify and those who manufacture with information which is clear, in the interest of not having terrible outcomes. Thank you. Now, I'm going to show you one or two further parts of this <coughs> document. Um, before I do that, and while I'm on page one here, you can see that in the first part of the page, first part of the text on that page, there are five bullet points underneath the sentence, yes. with Celotex RS5000, you are specifying an insulation board vert. And in the third bullet point says, has class naught fire performance. And then it says, throughout the entire product in accordance with BS476. Can you help us uh, with what a reasonably competent architect, let's say reasonably familiar with approved document B, would understand by that sentence? An, in, an intensity of spotlight has been placed on, on these words and terms. At that time, I think an architect would have just taken it as a simple, oh, most architects, I think, not can't speak for everyone, but most architects would have taken it as a simple assurance that the product meets class O in its entirety, full stop, it's okay. What does throughout the entire product mean in the context of, ha of having a class naught fire performance? Well, we've got the surface and we've got the, the, the remainder of it. Um, in, in so far as um, uh, this, is con this note is concerned, it seems to suggest that the entire product, right through its depth, carries that qualification. Is that comprehensible? Uh, when it's when it's dissected, probably not, because class O is to do with a surface spread of flame. Um, but it certainly seems to give an assurance, to me it almost gives an assurance beyond a surface spread of flame. But uh, scrutiny and investigation would suggest that that's not going to be likely. Is the reference to class naught there apposite in the context of what then follows, namely fire performance through the entire product? No. Can we then just turn on in the document? Again, it's misleading, I think. Yes, thank you. Can, can we turn on in the document to um, page three, please? Uh, we can skip page two, straight to page three, where you can see there it says, uh, under the uh, list, uh, where you get the list again of, com of components, the fire performance and classification report issued only relates to the components detailed above. Any changes to the components listed will need to be considered by the building designer. You can see that. Yes. And you can see the, test, the system tested. Again, from the perspective of the reasonably competent architect, is there anything misleading or unfairly presented about that s statement or sentence in its context? No, I, I, I can't add any more to what I said um, earlier, except for I would just ask, I've looked at this document before, but I don't remember. Is that pink banner across every page of the document? Uh, it's certainly, you're right, it's on page three. If we flip back to page two, it is also there. 
So I think the answer. And how many pages does the document have, sir? Uh, well, let's look on. Uh, let's look on to page. Uh, I, I'm not sure there is a page four. You're asking me a question, uh, which electronically I'm not able to answer. Uh, but uh, well, every page we've seen experiment. has got that banner on the top. Of yes, and certainly, I, certainly that's right. It seems to me to be reinforcing. There, there isn't a page four, I can tell you. So every page. Well, the, the, the flag line of this seems to be reinforcing at every point that this is a product suitable f above 18 metres in height. I, uh, I understand the, the qualification. I can't add any more to what I said before. Yes. Uh, can I ask you to go then back to your report, your supplemental report, please, at uh, PHYS602. And I'd like to start at page 50, please, just to give you the context. And let's look at paragraph 2.5.5 there, um, which you're talking here about uh, the Studio E's opening statement placing heavy emphasis on in its entitlement to rely on the advice and expertise of others. Uh, in this respect, it mentions within these paragraphs Max Fordham, Exova, Ryden, Harley, and Celatex. Of particular importance is Studio E's statement of paragraph 12.17, which I quote as follows. Studio E relied on the advice of the appointed specialists and suppliers that the products being considered were suitable for the intended purpose, and Studio E considers it was reasonable and appropriate for it to do so. And then if we turn the page, page 51, we can see what you say at paragraph 2.5.6. You say this. Whilst I fully understand that construction involves teamwork between both individuals within companies and across different companies that are independently appointed, in my opinion, an architect cannot, in circumstances of failure, offer as mitigation the fact that he, stroke she, had relied upon and indeed accepted the advice of others where that architect should either have known or routinely discovered through research and or interrogation that such information or advice was wrong. Now, just taking that paragraph and applying what you say there to uh, these three Celotex pieces of product literature about RS5000, um, what approach do you say an, ar an architect, a reasonably competent architect, should have taken to those pieces of literature? Well, I, I go back to earlier comments, I think, during this examination. I think that the architect um, should have known that they're going down the linear route. It, uh, 12, 7 is paragraph 12.7 of ADB, ADB, um, AB, approved document B2 is absolutely clear. Uh, limited combustibility is required. Um, therefore, the architect should be taking great care to make sure components in, are going into the building of limited combustibility. So that the starting point should be that expectation. Right. And when you say they're routinely discovered through research and or interrogation, are you saying that the reasonably competent architect should have uh, interrogated each of these three pieces of product literature in relation to RS5000? I, I, I think that is correct. I, I, but I don't in any way want to dim, diminish the criticism I make of Celotex's documentation or others who should have known better who were involved as part of the design team. That, that is all clearly, that's all my view. But at the same time, I, the architect, I think, should have known that, this, that the insulation must be so compliant and should have taken care to either res receive robust assurances from others or alternatively satisfy themselves through, through the most careful scrutiny of the documentation. But it's a difficult territory. Do you take the view that the Celotex RS5000 product literature read as a whole makes it clear reasonably or sufficiently clear to the reasonably competent architect that the fire performance and classification data relates only to the system tested in its exact components and setup, and that any changes to the components and construction method would need to be considered by the building design? It, the, the, that, is, that is the case. 
it does make it clear, but but I think it demands more more scrutiny and, and attention than it should, because I, I believe it. I think that document sets out to mil mislead, actually. In what way, exactly? Well, because it's, it, it's, it's carrying the banner across. It, it, the presumption is that the product is compliant, and the, the specifier has to interrogate the literature to discover that actually there are inconsistencies. There's, the therefore is missing. There's no um, qualification made early on, which should be there, in my opinion. So yes, when the architect, when the specifier studies the document fully, it should. Anybody specifying should be able to read that document. That's clear. And on reading that document, they should make the conclusion that it is not appropriate. That is clear. I don't think that the, it's responsible of a manufacturer to make that such a hard, to make that such heavy going, so, such hard work. But it should have been clear. You say it should have been clear, but you also say that it was clear to the reasonably competent architect. I'm just trying to well, that's my, my, tease out just, just yeah, well, where the line exactly should fall. Yes. Well, I understand, and I, I have to say that the it 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 should be clear to a, uh, a competent a, the architect should have read it, and it should be clear. The architect should have read it, and a competent architect would have understood it. Well, I think what you're saying then is that the competent architect should have read it with sufficient care to understand the limitations imposed by the nature of the test which is being relied on, but the manufacturer set out to make it difficult for him to do that. Is that broadly what Th you're saying? Thank you, yes. Um, I, I can't, others will interrogate the manufacturers to what they were doing, but it's certainly not, as, I believe that they should have spelled it out clearly. Absolutely the case. Yeah, yes, I, I see. Thank you for that. Uh, just, just to pick you up on one uh, way of putting it, put to you by the, by the chairman, the manufacturer set out to make it difficult. Whether or not the manufacturer intended subjectively to do that, uh, do you agree that the objective effect of what the manufacturer did made it difficult for him to do that, for the reasonable architect to yes. interrogate? Yes. Um, can I just then ask you to look at Dr. Lane's view about this, which is at BLAS 40, uh, I'm sorry, 5026. BLAS 5026 at page 25. This is paragraph E4.1.6 of her report. And she says here, I've also explained my opinion that any difference between the Grenfell Tower rain screen cladding and the system tested in the relevant supporting fire test evidence must, uh, means that test evidence cannot be relied upon to demonstrate compliance with the provisions made in section 12 of the ADB 2013 and particularly if no other supporting evidence is provided. Uh, do you agree with that view? Yes. Uh, and uh, she also says uh, in the same document at page 34, if we could move on a few pages to page 34, please. So could I just go back to that again and just read it again? Y yes, of course. Go back to page 25. Yes. 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 You agree with that? Yes. Yes, thank you. Can we then move um, uh, to page uh, 34, where she says at um, E438, uh, and also table E6, uh, she says, uh, this test report uh, does not, therefore does not classify the inspected as built uh, Grenfell Tower rain screen cladding system. It cannot therefore be relied on to demonstrate compliance with the provisions made in section 12.5 of, of the ADB 2013. You see that? Yes. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes. Uh, and if we go on to uh, the next uh, paragraph down, she says, further, it cannot be relied upon to demonstrate that the external wall at Grenfell Tower meets the functional requirement of B4 of the building regulations. Do you agree with that? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
D does that lead to this conclusion, in your opinion, Mr. Hyatt, that Studio E, uh, if, if they had been acting as the reasonably competent architect, uh, should not or would not have allowed R Celotex RS5000 to be specified or installed as part of the rain screen cladding system at Grenfell Tower? because the components of that system differed from that described as having been tested to meet the performance criteria in BR135. That, that I, I agree that, and that's consistent with what I've said in the report. Do you also think that further testing or a desktop study or perhaps a holistic fire engineering report should have been commissioned in order to be able to assess the rain screen cladding that was to be specified for installation? Yeah, if they were... Yes, if they, when they were going to use it, yes. And that means that there was, as things stood, is this right, no basis or no reasonable basis upon which Studio E could reasonably have concluded that the rain screen cladding system as specified and installed at Grenfell Tower was compliant? No, I don't think that they could have. I, I agree with that. Um, I would have uh, not bothered with any testing. Time wouldn't have allowed it. Time would not have allowed it. And I would have realised that... Um, it's a non-starter, but there we go. And, and to the extent that, is this right, to the extent that Studio E was seeking to rely on other design and construction professionals working on the Grenfell Tower project, uh, they were unreasonable in doing so in relation to the Celotex uh, material, the Celotex product. Well, um, I think they've got good reason to be, I said this yesterday, uh, they've got good reason to be more than unhappy that they've been, uh, I used the term, you know, fed a curve ball, had Max Fordham's suggest a material which clearly was unlikely to comply, that's the first point, and I think that they've got more, every reason to be very unhappy with Exova for not having pointed it out, having received the uh, stage C and stage D reports. That's all true, but that doesn't uh, exonerate um, Studio E, in my opinion. Now, we've talked about the differences between the system installed and the system as described in the Celotex literature as having been subjected uh, to a BS8414 test to meet the BR135 criteria. Uh, do you agree that those systems were mutually completely different? Yes. And just to finalise on this point, while we've got page 34 of... Uh, uh, of Dr. Lane's report up here on the page. Sorry, that's the system that was in the test against the system that's been installed? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and just to round off on this point, while we've got this page in front of us, could you please look at E436, E4.3.6, at the top of page 34 of... Dr. Lane's report. She says there, I conclude from my comparison that there are multiple dif significant differences between the rain screen system tested in BS84142 2005, and she describes the title of that, produced by BRE Global on the 1st of August 2014, and BS84141 2015 and A1 2017, test on a ventilated Marley Eternit rain screen system with Celotex RS5000 insulation on the 30th of April 2018, when compared with the as built Grenfell Tower construction. Um, to the extent that you're familiar with what she's referring to there, would you agree with it? Absolutely. Can we then turn to the subject of window infill panels? Um, when I say window infill panels, um, I know that you know what I'm talking about from your demonstration yes. in your model. If um, we're changing topic, I'm going to ask if I could take my jacket off. Of course you may, yes. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Right. Um, is it your opinion that paragraph 12.7 of approved document B applies to products with an insulating core, such as the window infill panels? Yes, I've made that clear in the report. And is it your view that win the window infill panels constituted a part of the external wall construction rather than the window? I believe that to be the case. I think th th 
others could take a different view, but I believe it is. Let's just look at the um, NBS specification. SCA uh, 50169, please. And I'd like to take you to page 145 in that document. This is L10, which is described as windows, stroke, roof light, stroke, screen, stroke, louvers. And I'd like to show you paragraph 332 at the top of the page. Aluminium windows, fixed unit aluminium. And then about a third of the way down, you'll see the second bullet point. Do you see? It says panel stroke facing type, aluminium-faced insulated panel comprising core insulation, aluminium lining panel, and integrated channel profile around perimeter, fully air-sealed at edges to achieve minimum U-value of 0.15. Yes, I've um, seen that. Given that that is in the NBS specification uh, for uh, window infill panels, at the windows part of the specification, how can you explain why you say it's actually part of the external wall rather than part of the, the windows? The, um, interesting question. I hadn't thought of it that way before. The, the, um, the, window, the windows, in the sense of those parts of... I'll begin, if I may, with the fact that we've got two columns... And between the columns, there is what I've described as ribbon window system. And that's a fairly well-known term throughout the architectural world, a ribbon window system. That ribbon window system is a series of windows with glazing in, which are fixed into an overall frame. I believe that's the way it goes. And with, within there, you can put multiple windows. Within that framing system, they've put a solid infill panel. And behind that panel, um, or they put an infill panel, sorry, a, an infill panel which, um, um, which is not glazed. Behind that panel, there is a section of wall. And that is an upstand from the spandrel panel, which, is, uh, which was part of the original building, uh, back, built back in the 70s, manufactured off-site, brought to site, placed on top of the wall, on pins, I suspect, and then bolted to the soffit, the concrete soffit. So that part of the ribbon window system crosses a piece of wall. I think that uh, my interpretation of that was that that then forms part of the wall of the building. It's not, it's not a, a window in that sense. Now, your understanding, as you've just explained it to us, is that something that would commonly have been understood by the reasonably competent architect at the time of the NBS specification? Probably not. Can you give us an insight into how common the view was at the time that um, insulated infill panels such as those which were part of the windows as per the NBS specification should in fact have been treated as part of the external wall construction instead? That I'm afraid I cannot do because I have absolutely no no basis upon which to give any advice there. I've, I've not questioned others. I've seen no reports about it. Right. I've, I know of no other circumstances like this, other cases like it. I have no idea. All I can say is that as I came to this um, uh, um, piece of work, I interpreted it that way. Can we go to your uh, supplemental report, please, at PHYS602 at page 38? And we have here paragraph 2.3.47. And you say uh, here uh, in the uh, second half of the paragraph, five lines down, you say, therefore, a detailed drawing for these elements of the works was required to show the design principles of the envelope, to brief the specialist subcontractor for the cladding, and to indicate the arrangements for design of the internal window lining and insulation and packing behind those linings for which the architect was responsible under stages E and F1 for tendering purposes and under stages F2 and K during the post-novation period. Now, that's, that's what you say there. Now, in the absence of that detailing design, detailed design, 
and as the NBS specification had, had shown, a PIR insulation for use within the external cavity, would you think that it was reasonable for a design and build contractor such as Ryden to, to adopt the same type of insulation product specified for the external cavity for use in the internal window linings? I was trying to read the first part of that paragraph as well because yes, I'm sorry, it I took me in at, you, at, at the fifth line, sixth line. May I read the first part as well? Yes, of course. Right. Could you ask the question again? Yes. Please. Um, let me try it a slightly different way. W would you consider it reasonable for a design and build contractor to adopt the same type of insulation product which had been specified for the external cavity uh, to be used in the internal window linings? I'm not, I'm not happy with a contractor drawing his own conclusions as to what can be used where. The architect's information uh, with the employer's requirements uh, made reference to um, a different arrangement for the window linings, head, jams, and sills. I think that a contractor should not presume, not make presumptions that arrangements shown elsewhere can be applied. Um, there was a, a significant switch to those linings. The plastic um, uh, sill, jams, and head, that's a, a very significant switch on its own. And then the packing, insulation, and or filler material, because it was functioning in all those ways, uh, behind it. And I, I think that it's a significant deviation from the employer's requirements. and. Um, Authority, for want of a better term, should have been sought for that. Thank you. Um, before we leave this topic, let me show you something else within the NBS specification that might give us a clue. Can we go, please, to SEA 50169 at page 243? Um, if you look at paragraph 235 towards the foot of the page, you can see that it says compressible insulation in gaps. And you can see there that what is specified is rock wool uh, and, in the second bullet point specifically, mineral wool to BS EN 13162. Um, would that have been a direction given by the reasonably competent architect to the design and build contractor as to what should be used uh, in the internal linings, yes. window linings? Yes, yes, sir. Does that mean that, in your opinion, the reasonably competent architect would have expected Ryden, or the designer bill contractor, instead of reaching for the same materials used within the external uh, wall construction, um, to instead to have used rock wool in the gaps uh, on the inside of the windows? Absolutely. I'm now going to turn to a new topic completely, which is cavity barriers. Can I ask you to start, please, by going to your report at page uh, 110, PHYR 5028 at page 110. PHYR 5028 at page 110. And we can see here, uh, you, you say at paragraph 3.11.3, uh, and this is in the context of your indicative approach. Uh, you say, for the avoidance of doubt, this, which is your indicative approach, should not be taken as a design that HKS architects would adopt. Now, is the indicative approach that you've adopted in relation to cavity barriers an approach that you personally, or HKS as a firm, have ever actually adopted in practice? The exact arrangement that I've developed there, no. Yes, we haven't had a situation like that, and so no, we haven't adopted that exact arrangement. Why did you prepare an indicative approach? Um, I, I felt 
that it would be useful to the inquiry for me to test whether the um, general approach to the overclouding of the building could have been carried out in a way that was functionally equivalent to the intentions, that's the U value to be achieved, uh, aesthetically um, similar. Um, so I thought it would be useful for the inquiry to, to see whether that could be achieved. And in the doing of that, um, I, I learned that it, I was also able to demonstrate the processes that an, an architect would go through, typically, in solving a problem like this. Now, there's no um, cast iron method statement. You can't pull a book down off a shelf that tells you how to do it. But as I said yesterday, um, or the day before maybe, uh, we're problem solvers. We face a new problem. And every building is a prototype, actually. It's almost true. Occasionally get rep repetition, but almost every building is a prototype. This was a prototype. Um, they're facing this. It's a bespoke design. And so they're, they're going to piece this whole thing together. And it seemed to me that if I did an indicative scheme, I would show how close it would have been possible to get the overall solution um, to comply with ADB2. And secondly, it would reveal the process that an architect would routinely go through. And I felt that, that pro in the end, actually, looking back at it, I think it's the process that has been more revealing and interesting than the product. Uh, because I, I, I mapped out, I reported carefully on the process that I actually adopted to solve this, uh, to solve this problem. And I, I hope that that gives useful insight. Because against that, in, in section four of my report, I've criticized what was done, but I've also been able to criticize the way in which things were done. Yes, thank you. Could you explain the role that a review of the building regulations and the associated guidance had in the preparation of your indicative uh, approach? Yes, I, I place great importance on um, this kind of work. Um, I think at the, at the outset of a, of a project, uh, it's very important to do. I think I called it a code review. Uh, you did. And it would be wrong of me to say that at the outset of every project, an architect must sit down and do a code review. If an architect's been doing a particular kind of building repeatedly, or parts of a building repeatedly, some architects are doing high-rise new builds all the time, they wouldn't do a code review because they know the codes. They would, of course, want to keep up to date with any changes. If you haven't worked on that type of building before, a restaurant, whatever it is, then I think a code review is absolutely essential. And I carried out that um, myself at the beginning, uh, very thoroughly, actually, in order to understand what I would have to be achieving with the design, with the detailed design as I went through it. Now, you refer in your report to the development of a cavity barrier strategy. Yes. And you use the word cavity barrier yes. strategy. Yes, yes. What is a cavity barrier strategy in particular? Well, first of all, it's, I developed that term entirely for this situation. But there are choices from the beginning as to where you put, I mentioned this again yesterday, where you put the cavity bars, particularly the vertical ones, there are choices. And so decisions have to be made. And the only way I can think of sensibly doing that is to holistically get uh, the, the entirety of the building in the mind, look at all of the different circumstances, all the different situations that have to be dealt with, and then piece together an approach and there may be some, um, some adjusting, some rationalizing, but piece together an approach which is as clear and as simple as possible that will deal with every eventuality that is found in the building. Out of that, we end up with a thing that's called, and I remember this right from the beginning of my career, you end up with a thing called typical details and specials. The typical details will deal with usually 90% of the building. And then you've got the specials, whatever it might be, the circumstances which have to be dealt with uh, in an entirely different way. They've got to be addressed carefully. An architect must be careful to sort out the typical and then to identify the specials and get them sorted as well. <laughs> All of that went into the cavity barrier strategy. But the big thing, uh, I'm sorry if the answer is too long, but the key thing I, I'd like to 
uh, emphasize is that I don't think that a, an architect can look, can apply ADB2 to individual details of the building. The building, the facades must be looked at as a whole. Do you take the view that a reasonably competent architect ought to have developed a cap cavity barrier strategy for this project? Yes. Either have one or develop one. And just very, and very briefly, why is that? Because uh, if, if you don't do that, you're at great risk of failing to apply ADB2. Can we then look at your report, please, uh, at um, PHYR5029, and look at page 16, please. I'd like to go to paragraph 4.1.40, where you say, I note that whilst cavity barriers have been extensively used in connection with various lightweight cladding systems of metal and or composite construction, Dr. Lane has, at paragraph 10.3.39, stroke figure yeah. 10.19 of her report, advised that the effectiveness of cavity barriers can be compromised in circumstances where the rain screen panel distorts due to heat. That is a matter that I will leave, matter that I will leave to other experts to comment on. I was not aware of such potential problems before reading Dr. Lane's report and would not think it appropriate to criticise Studio E or any other architects who were also so unaware. Uh, on that subject, is it correct that this issue here is that if the cladding panels deform in heat and then fall away, then the external cavity essentially ceases to exist, uh, or, or at least the spread of smoke and fire is not hidden from view, and therefore the role of the cavity barrier becomes non-existent? That's and correct. Redundant, right. right. And is it your opinion that the use of open state cavity barriers which are mechanically fixed and bonded, as you propose in details three to six of your report, and we can get to these if we need to, as opposed to the system designed or approved by Studio E, would resist fire spread for a reasonable period? The arrangements that I have shown would inhibit the passage of fire. Um, this is particularly important around the windows. So the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So you don't think, and this is in contradistinction, uh, that it would be defeated by the issue Dr. Lane has identified, namely that me metal cladding uh, melts or deforms and renders the intumescent cavity barriers ineffective. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I now um, have greater insight into that question. I cannot know the answer to that. Much work will be done on that more work than has already been done, I'm sure. People like Dr. Lane will give very good advice in the future on that. All I can say is that in the, applying the, the ADB2 um, uh, as it stood at the time in pursuit of satisfying the building regulations, the arrangements that I have shown in terms of the positions of the cavity barriers, uh, I believe, complies with that. And any other arrangement, uh, well, the arrangements I've seen drawn uh, do, by Studio E and Harley do not comply. Do you consider that your uh, arrangements would keep the cavity barriers functional for sufficiently long uh, to resist flame spread adequately? Um, that is a question I, I, I simply cannot answer because uh, the ferocity of the fire due to the the fuel available to it, fires burn at different temperatures. I mean, we can think of 9-11, where plane 30 tons of fuel, high-octane fuel, launched into the building. That, that gives an instantaneous fire of the most tremendous heat. That is a different fire to the kind of fire you might get in a living room where pieces of furniture ignite and take a relatively long time to achieve um, their full heat, and probably don't achieve a heat anything like the first one I described, the 9-11. I, I was involved a little bit in comedy, and that's why I know. So it's the intent, and I did work on the fire research test station, as you know. It's the, it's the intensity of the heat and the speed with which that, um, that fire accelerates, which is the problem. I have no way of knowing how long the cavity barriers would have lasted in those circumstances. What I can say is that they would have done a better job 
than what was shown, because what was shown didn't exist in some respects. But the key part is, around, I, I believe that the, the, the perimeter of the windows, and particularly the jams, and I don't want to tread on the toes of the specialist fire um, um, experts, but it's evident to me that the head and the sill had a level of protection because of the aluminium shelf angles. Now, those don't satisfy ADB2, but nevertheless, I've seen them on the building, and they remain, in many cases, reasonably intact. The, the, the weakness was the jams, as the model shows very clearly. There, we have the 120 millimeter vertical gap for something like a meter's height. Yeah. And well, we're going to come to we're going to come okay to, i'm sorry but thank you for that now can i ask you to go to phyr 5029 at page 73 same document page 73 and let's look together at paragraph 4.3.80 there towards the foot of the page underneath figure 4.56 and the context of this is uh, the emails in early november 2013 between exova and studio e about cavity barriers. Uh, and you say uh, here, uh, um, in paragraph 4.3.80, from the fifth line down, you say, however, whilst I'm aware that Dr. Lane has expressed concern in this respect, such concern was not widely publicized at the time of preparing the tender documents for the 2012 to 16 works. Cavity barriers were widely used in such circumstances, and I would not wish to criticize Studio E in this respect. The exhibit below from Siderai's current website clearly implies that the products are suitable for use within rain screen cladding systems, and there is no qualification to the effect that the products are not suitable for use with metal rain screen systems. Um, do you accept, however, that it's not appropriate for a designer to accept the suitability of a product based either on the fact that it's commonly used or on assertions made by product manufacturers without at least a degree of interrogation by the designer. Yeah, I, I think that follows, yes. Now let's just explore this a little bit further then. Um, a paragraph 4.4.123 4. Um, uh, of your report, and uh, this is a page 127 of the same document. Let's just go to that. 4.4.123. Um, you say there, and this is in the context of the end of the email run in March 2015 involving Terry Ashton, Neil Crawford, uh, and uh, Ryden. Um, you uh, say there, on the 31st of March 2015, Mr. Crawford emails the following comment to Mr. Ashton, and you give the reference. Thanks, this was my point as well. Metal cladding always burns and falls off, hence fire stopping is usually just at the back of the cladding line. Thanks for this confirmation anyway. Again, this shows a lack of understanding of the principles of cavity barrier installations and a repeated misuse of the terminology through reference to fire stopping. You see that? Yes. Uh, 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 now, b before I come to a question on that, Mr. Crawford, uh, whose email that was, as you say, clarified that email in his evidence uh, to the inquiry. Can we go to the transcript, please, for day 10, and go within that to page 153? And at line 14, uh, I ask him, having shown him uh, the email, I say, now, I just want to focus on the words, metal cladding always burns and falls off. Were you saying that there was no point in installing cavity barriers behind the ACM rain screen because in the event of an external fire, there would be nothing to hold them in place to seal the cavity? Answer, fire stopping, you mean, question. Uh, question, well, and then he says that's specifically what that's referring to, holding fire stopping in place if, if it fell off. A cavity barrier would be kept in place. And then he goes on, on page 154, if we can just flip to that, um, to say... First of all, I, sorry to interrupt you, but I don't understand what's being said there, but we'll no doubt come back to it. Well, we will. Um, let's just show you the whole of his evidence, and we can certainly come back to it, or will do. Uh, but just let me show you page 154. Um, he, he, uh, he goes on to say, uh, at line six, it's a poor choice of words, it should have been melts and fails and falls off, but that was my experience. And the reference 
specifically was to previous projects where I had been working within. The best way to explain it is within a building, you have compartments and you have the facade, which can be anything from curtain walling or brick, whatever it is. But the compartment, which you know in this case would be an apartment, you have compartment walls that are lines of fire resistance, and the external wall it generally isn't a line of fire resistance unless you have a boundary issue. And then he says... Um, so what happens in, if you have a developed fire scenario, then the compartment itself is protected, but the facade will fail or buckle, melt, fall off, and the specific reference I made in my witness statement was where I had been working on a project and it was made clear to me that that's what happens. I think it's sometimes it's misconstrued. People think there is a requirement for some level of fire resistance on the external wall, and there isn't. Basically, in a fire scenario, they fail except where you have the relative boundary issue. Now, that was his evidence. Now, just could look just at it. read that last sentence again? Basic Basically, in a fire scenario, they fail, except where you have the relative boundary issue. Now, um, I've shown you a, a large amount of what he told the inquiry. Um, what is your opinion on the distinction that's being drawn here and in the emails between fire stopping and cavity barriers? Well, fire stopping is defined in ADB 2. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, you can look it up in the index. You can find it in the definitions. I can't remember where, but I've read it. It's defined. Um, it's also on diagram 33. I believe that's the correct diagram. Um, cavity barriers are also defined um, in the index. They're in the definitions. And they're in uh, the diagram 33, and they clearly have a different function. The fire stopping uh, is to basically fill imperfections in connection so that if you've got a concrete floor, for example, coming up against a brick or block wall, there may be a gap between the two. That is inside the building. That will be sealed with fire stopping. Cavity barriers have a different function, and they are as their name suggests, for placing inside the cavities. And the principle there is to, is to inhibit the passage of fire into the cavity. It's also out of the cavity, um, around openings, windows, doors, at the top and at the bottom, and then at various intervals through in order to inhibit uh, or impede the passage of fire if fire gets into the cavity to impede its onward passage. So they're, they're quite different things, and they should not be muddled up. When it comes to an external cavity wall, and particularly the cavity within the rain screen system, is there a distinction between fire stopping and cavity barriers? When it comes to an external wall, um, well, I described the relationship between the external wall and the internal structure. Yes. I haven't seen, uh, I don't remember on diagram 33, seeing any fire stopping actually within the external wall itself. All, the, all that is shown there is cavity barriers. Do you agree that there's no material distinction between the effectiveness of a cavity barrier and the effectiveness of fire stopping if the metal cladding were to fail and fall off, exposing the external cavity. Sorry, could you ask that again? Yes. Is there a material... Let me try it differently. Is there a material difference between the effectiveness, effectiveness of a cavity barrier on the one hand and fire stopping on the other if, in, in, in any case, the metal cladding were to fail and fall off in the event of a fire, exposing the Well, cavity. there would be a passage round either, so... Um, the answer is if there's no, if there's no cavity left because one part, one leaf of the cavity is gone, whatever it's made of, um, then whether it's fire stopping or a cavity barrier, that will be there'll be a route around it. If ACM such as the Rainebond PE55 was going to fail and fall away in a fire, uh, and I take your point about it may depend upon the magnitude of the fire, but but generally speaking, if it was going to fail and fall away. Do you consider that an alternative approach to the cavity barrier strategy should have been adopted? We, well, the, the, with respect, Mr. 
um, the missing word there is, is time. It's the length of time. Um, everything in the end is going to burn, fall away. You know, the whole building will collapse in the end if the fire is maintained and grows to such intense levels uh, or magnitude, as you, the term you used. The issue here is to provide protection for the periods that the ADB2 guidance gives. That's what the, uh, um, the requirement of the design team, that was the requirement that the design team had to comply with. Um, so yes, the, the cladding um, will eventually burn and fall off. Yes, um, any, any cavity barriers that are left at that time will be breached, of course. But ADB2 is giving guidance to inhibit the passage of fire for a period of time, and that's for the fire brigade to get, et cetera, et cetera. You know that story. And so I, I, I think, in a sense, I, I'm, I'm not moved by the fact that the cladding will fall off. Brick walls collapse under intense fire. Uh, coming back to your indicative <coughs> approach, can you just tell us, in uh, as briefly as you can, what it is about your indicative approach, so far as concerns the cavity barriers? Uh, which would give the fire brigade more time uh, than they had with the actual cavity barriers actually installed on the building? Well, if I may, there's, there's two parts to that question, and I'll just be very quick with the first. The first is the difference with the indicative design that I've shown is that it complies, I believe, with ADB2 full stop. So if there's a fault with ADB2, then that's another issue, but it complies with that. M it will take specialists to advise how long, against various degrees of magnitude of fire, that situation that I've shown may have delayed the fire. But I am absolutely, and I, I can't qualify my answer with that level of information. I haven't done, the, I wouldn't be capable of doing the investigations. But I do know, as sure as night follows day, that if you've got a 120 millimeter gap that is a meter tall, and you've got fuel both sides of that gap, then the fire is going to move through that gap. If you have a material which has been designed to delay the progress of fire, and it is packed in there tightly, which is what it should have been, then the fire is going to be delayed. And therefore, the fire brigade will have longer to deal with the situation. And would it follow, therefore, that the later it would be that the cladding would eventually fail and fall off? Exactly. I see. And it may be that the fire would have been put out, and again, that's speculation, so others will qualify what I say. But it may be that the fire would have been delayed sufficiently for the fire brigade to have put it out before it got into the cladding. That's something that others will give better advice than me on. Can we then go to PHYR uh, 5029 at page 126? So we're in your report page 126, and let's look together at paragraph 4.4.121. Uh, and uh, you uh, are considering here Mr. Ashton's uh, email to Mr. Crawford or reply to Mr. Crawford on the 31st of March 2015, and you've given the reference to that, EXO 50715. Uh, and that's the email from Terry Ashton to Neil Crawford of that date where Mr. Ashton says uh, in the third line, but, well, let's take it from the top, in fact, it's probably better. This isn't something that would necessarily form part of the fire safety strategy for a building. Therefore, it would not have been dealt with in the fire safety strategy for this building. I agree with Ben Kay. Um, I think he means Ricky Kay of Ciderize there, rather than Ben Bailey of Harley, just to make the point. I believe that a cavity barrier is all that is required in this application. Even if we were to agree with RBKC, it is difficult to see how a fire stop would stay in place in the event of a fire where external flaming occurred, as this would cause the zinc cladding to fail. Uh, 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 and then you go on to say um, uh, that uh, um, this response brings the earlier Exova statements into question. And you say this, as I cannot understand how the statement below can be reconciled with Mr. Ashton's comment above, it seems to me that a statement confirming that the proposed changes will have no adverse effect on the building in relation to external fire spread could not be made without having given due consideration to the external walls construction. And then you set out an extract from the Exova Fire Strategy Report. And just to be clear, this is issue three of the 7th of November 2013 at paragraph 3.1.4. 
compliance with B4 external fire spread, it is considered that the proposed changes will have no adverse effect on the building in relation to external fire spread, but this will be confirmed by an analysis in a future issue of, the, of this report. Uh, now, my question is, um, ought Mr Ashton's comment have motivated Studio E to provide more details as to the cavity barrier strategy? Yes, I've, I think that's correct. Uh, and ought Mr Co Ashton's comment uh, have motivated or prompted Studio E to confirm to the TMO and Ryden that there is a uh, concern in respect of cavity barriers staying in place and thus fire safety strategy as developed thus far was incomplete and needed further work? Sorry, when I answered the previous question, I was answering it on the basis that Studio E should have ensured that Mr. Ashton had all the information that he needed to answer the, the, the question, because I think that there was a lack of clarity on Mr. Ashton's part as to how the external wall was, was um, uh, to be um, fabricated. Yes, and, and should that have prompted that lack of clarity have prompted Studio E to go to the TMO, uh, its original client, uh, and potentially its erstwhile client as well, and Ryden, uh, its client, um, to tell them that there was a, a concern about the cavity barrier strategy. Well, uh, Ryden, yes. I, person, I, I prefer not to bother clients too often during a, a, a project, but I think that um, this was certainly a time for everybody to get their heads around around the issue. Very good. And as an architect, would you reasonably expect the fire engineer to limit their advice to cavity barrier placement? I, um, I think that they, they have to be sure that they understand the entirety of the construction. There may be, uh, having established that and given general advice, there may be occasions when a specific question is asked, and they might restrict their advice just to that, that part. But they need to be sure they understand the whole before they begin advising. And in the context of this particular email and the, and the emails that surround it, would, you have ex um, would the reasonably competent architect have expected the uh, fire engineer, in this case Exova, simply to have limited their advice to cavity barrier placement, or, or to have come back to them and said, well, I now need lots of information so that I can now produce my uh, promised future issue and do the analysis of external fire spread on all the information. The, the, the architect should have ensured that the, the, uh, that the work was completed by Exover, or alternatively that somebody else did it. Could we then turn to... Uh, page 127 of this report, next page, and look at uh, paragraph 4.4.124, where we see Mr. Pearson of Exover's uh, email to Ashton, Mr. Ashton, of the 31st of March, 2015, and you quote from that uh, extensively. Uh, uh, I'd better read it all to you before coming to what you say about it. You s he says, we note that the barrier against fire spread between floors is provided through the connection of the structural floors to the existing external walls. The existing external walls are expected to provide sufficient fire resistance to prevent fire from entering the cavities at or near floor or ceiling level. We would not rule out that fire could enter the cavity if there is flaming through the windows. However, if significant flames are ejected from the windows, this would lead to failure of the cladding system with the external surface falling away and exposing the cavity, eliminating the potential for unseen fire spread. A standard cavity barrier should be sufficient to prevent fire spread between floors while there remains a cavity. In view of the above, we do not feel that there should be a need for a two-hour rated fire break in the cavities along the lines of the compartment floors or walls. And then you say, commenting on that email, again, this demonstrates to me a fundamental lack of understanding of the principles involved in ADB2 guidance with respect to inhibiting the passage of fire into the cavity behind the rain screen cladding and thereafter onwards through it. Can you summarise for us the, what you say is the fundamental lack of understanding here? 
The, I, I think um, this inquiry has put a spotlight on the issue of compartmentation when it comes to external walls. We have a compartment, um, think of it almost uh, like just a rectangular box, there's the compartment. It's got an internal wall which opens onto the uh, public areas of the building, the stairs, the lifts, etc. It's got two side walls which link to the next flat usually and it's got a, 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 a floor and a ceiling. So there you have a compartment. The final face of that compartment is the outside wall. And if that wall, as I was mentioning a few minutes ago, is sealed to the floor, the compartment, the internal compartment floors and the walls, then you have a sealed box. Mm. What was done here was, was to produce an entirely new condition, which is uh, a, a, a a cavity outside the building, there wasn't one before, and so we now have the, the potential for the passage of fire within that cavity itself. And I think um, um, Ms Menzies um, suggested in her evidence that the compartment floors should have been carried straight through the um, external wall to its perimeter. Uh, that would be to the back of the rain to the back of the ACM. I don't think that that is the way that um, architects would interpret ADB2 guidance. The guidance doesn't suggest that the cavity, um, that the compartment wall has to be carried right to the back face of the outer lining. It suggests that cavity barriers should be placed in there. And I think that um, this um, um, response from Exova, Mr. Pearson, should have summarized the situation as I've just summarized it and indicated that ADB2 requires uh, the arrangement that I've shown on the indicative scheme. I see. Now, so there may well be shortfalls with ADB2. In yes. fact, I think there certainly are, but that's, that's what is suggested. I see. Um, and if I may, an expert organization like Exova might have pointed to the weaknesses and the problems and suggested an alternative route or greater care. But I wouldn't expect an architect to do that. Sorry, you didn't ask that question. Uh, I just wanted to be a bit more precise about, if you could summarize in a sentence for me, what it is that Mr. Pearson has got fundamentally wrong. We know that the barrier begins fire. Perhaps you want to look at the second paragraph down, in particular, of the quotation. Yeah, I'm looking at that. Well, um, however, if significant flames were ejected from the windows, this would lead to failure of the cladding system with the external surface falling away and exposing the cavity. The, the, the key point here, I think, is where those flames are going to go. Are they going to go on the outside of the um, ACM, or are they going to go to the inside of the ACM? If they go to the inside of the ACM, there is a potential for a a far greater um, ferocity of fire. It's, uh, it's, it's con there are conditions there. There's a chimney effect for a start. Um, there are conditions, it's almost like a bellows. Far greater heat can be, uh, and there's fuel inside that cavity. If that fuel, that is the um, Celotex, catches fire and is burning rapidly in that uh, tight area with a plentiful supply of oxygen, uh, through it, it's, it's like a chimney. The, that, the impact of that on the back of the um, ACM um, uh, will be considerable. We talked yesterday about the cuts to the edges of the, um, of the trays. We've got the polyethylene, which can pour out inside. I so I, I think that, um, that those are all issues that should have been in um, Mr. Pearson's mind. I see. Is, is it, can, I, can I summarize it this way, perhaps? That, uh, and I know we're interpreting 
a document, and it's not really your role, to, and certainly not my role to do that, but is your understanding, from the point of view of an expert architect, that the basic error here is that he has confused a flat on fire with a cladding system on fire? I, I, I think that is, that is correct. Um, but I, I'm... You see, we go back and look at words you've written, a fundamental lack of understanding of the principles involved in ADB2. I, if I may, I'd just like to go back. Significant flames rejected from the windows. S significant flames can be ejected from the windows without much adverse effect because, as we know from, um, I think it was Mr. Torero's advice, and I know this from moving my hand towards a candle on the dining table. You can move your finger towards the candle. There's no burning sensation, not at all. You can travel right to within half an inch of the candle, and then suddenly the, the, in, the, the exponential increase in temperature is extraordinary. The reverse is also true, as Mr. Torero told us. So flames can come out of the building into the open air, and those flames don't do that much damage. It's when they get into a situation situation like the cavity with fuel, there is the danger. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment for a break? I think it probably is, yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you. We'll have a short break now. Thank you. Mr Hyatt, usual rules, no talking when you're out of the room, please, at least about your evidence, that is. And we'll come back at 20 to 12, please. Thank you very much. Twenty to twelve, please.
Would you like to ask Mr Hyatt to come back in, please? All right, Mr Hyatt, ready to carry on? Yes, I am, um, sir, but could I ask Mr Miller to please, would you take me back to Mr Pearson's um, um, quote, because I'm, I'm not happy that I gave a concise and clear answer on that. Yes, of course. Can we go to PHYR 5029 at page 127? Right. I was concentrating, I think, too much. May I speak? Uh, yeah. I was concentrating yeah, yeah. too much on the second paragraph. And if I take that from the top down, we note that the barrier against fire spread between floors is provided through the connection of the structural floors to the ex existing external walls. The existing external walls are expected to provide sufficient fire resistance to prevent fire from entering the cavities at or near floor or ceiling level. Well, that I don't think is adequate and it's not strictly true. The jams have to be considered equally. The next sentence says, if significant flames are ejected from the windows. Now, I assume that to mean through the windows, whether the glass is broken or not, but not around the windows. The key here is that the fire passed, we know, through and around the windows. This is absolutely critical. In view of the above, we do not feel that there should be a need for two hours rated fire break. Well, that's a fair answer to the question about the cavity barrier, but to, to say that we note that the barrier against fire spread between floors is provided through the connection of the structural floors to the existing external walls, that is not adequate because if you get that right, that, is, that, it, that implies that that will stop fire spreading, but it won't. If the fire goes out through the jams, then it's in the cavity and it can spread between the floors. I think I was unwise in the use of the word a fundamental lack of understanding. I am sure Mr. Pearson uh, fully understands, but I think that this demonstrated uh, a failure in the advice because he should have called for, and Exova should have called for, the complete information on the cavity barriers in order for them to give the proper advice. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, before I continue uh, on to the next topic, uh, which will be cavity barriers at the head of the window, I feel I need to correct something that uh, you said earlier and I perhaps encouraged you in. And this was about the timing of the publication of the Celotex RS5000 Compliance Guide. Um, can we um, go back to that document? Uh, because I drew your attention to the fact that it was dated as of February 2015. Um, uh, and you said uh, that when comp considering the compliance guide, the timing, of course, of all this is very late, you said, because the document was not, I think, available at the time that this product was first proposed. So this would, an architect who's adopted this product earlier on, would not necessarily be revisiting the head of this conversation. And the point that um, you'd made just before raising that issue was that on page three of the compliance guide, uh, it was absolutely clear that when you looked at the right-hand side of the page, page three, that the classification applies only to the system as tested and detailed in the classification report. Uh, and that report covers the end-use application. That's the text of it. Now, the point I want just to put to you is that, in fact, this compliance guide was available in August 2014, not only as at February 2015. And can we just look at one or two documents just to make that good? First, please, CEL 6012. Now, that is the rain screen cladding compliance guide. And if we look at uh, the next document, CEL 401237, uh, here is an email from Jonathan Room to Ben Sharman of Harley of the 6th of August 2014. And uh, he says in the second paragraph, 
I have pleasure uh, of informing you as of yesterday we've now launched the first PIR board to successfully meet the performance criteria and BR135 for insulated rain screen cladding systems, therefore acceptable for use in buildings above 18 metres in height, and, and says he wants to come and launch the product. And there's an attachment, rain screen insulation launch. Uh, and that was also provided to Harley on the 27th of August 2014. Um, and that's CEL 706. Let's just have a look at that. CEL 706, please. This is a, an email of that date, 27th of August 2014, from Jonathan Room to Daniel Lancaster Jones at Harley. And he's sending him the RS5000 data. If it's correct that the compliance guide that I've just shown you uh, was the document that was provided on those dates, and that therefore Harley was provided with the compliance guide in August 2014, would that change your view? Um, my view in which respect, sorry? Well, you, you, you said um, the timing of this was very late and an architect who's adopted this product earlier wouldn't necessarily be revisiting the whole of this conversation. So if it's correct that all three documents were available in August to the architect instead of just the, 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 the two, the, the, um, the two I showed you earlier, but also the compliance guide, as opposed to February 2015, would that change your view? I, I, the, uh, can you give me the date um, of the um, employer's requirements? Uh, they were um, issued to tenderers in November 2013. Well, I think that's the point. The, the specifier, the architect in this case, will carry out work necessary to get documentation completed, and I don't think revisits unless there's some major alarm or alert. So I wouldn't expect them to have revisited it particularly. Can we then uh, go to the topic I wanted to come to, which is the uh, cavity barriers around the head of the windows, please. And before we look at the detail, I just want to ask about the requirement for cavity barriers around openings. Um, can we go first, please, to Mr. Soames's oral evidence to the inquiry at day 21 of the transcript, please? And I'd like to go to page 73 at line 7. And here, Ms. Grange is asking Mr. Soames, um, what was it about these provisions of ADB that we've just looked at that would suggest to you that in a rain screen cladding system you wouldn't have to provide cavity barriers around openings? And his answer was, well, this is line 11, well, the approved document is silent on rain screen. It doesn't discuss it. But I believe the diagram 33 refers to a very conventional form of construction and not a rain screen, which is essentially outside. The cavity is outside. It's vented, pressure equalized, if you like. It doesn't offer any resistance to flame from the outside or flames coming around the window opening. And then he goes on to say in line 19, so I couldn't have, I would have read that as unclear. What is your opinion as to Mr. Soames's reading of diagram 33 and ADB in this respect? Diagram 33 is not a good diagram, it looks like a house. Um, so that's the starting point. But I think the intention is pretty clear, the, the colours are not clear, you've got the very light grey for the cavity barrier. I'm going entirely from memory now and um, you've got a, a, a diagram which is wrongly titled as well, um, which doesn't help. But I think that between the, uh, the, the language used, words used in ADB2 and the diagram, it is absolutely clear that the uh, surround of, of openings should have cavity barriers to inhibit the passage of fire. Now, Mr. Soane's, and I'm summarising his evidence, I hope, fairly, said that he essentially left the matter to Mr. Reck of Studio E, whom he thought had consulted with perhaps Exova, Siderize and Harley on this. If that's correct, do you consider that Mr. Soane's course of action was one which a reasonably competent architect heading up the design team at Studio E would have adopted? To leave this matter to Mr. Reck? Uh, uh, and others outside Studio E, for example, Exova or Cider Rise or Harley? I, 
an, an architect carries an enormous amount of information in their head at the start of a job. So, somebody needs to have their arms around, if you ex accept that term, the project and understand it. There may be parts of a very large project that are handed out to um, uh, another person to look after. For example, the cladding, that could be done. But somebody at uh, Studio E needed to be able to report with great confidence that this issue had been dealt with and dealt with properly. And I, I think that actually, I don't understand enough about the way the firm was structured, but I would not be happy. Mr. Reck, I think, was, was he a qualified architect or not? I think he came from, he'd been in the country recently, I think. I'm not sure. Yes. I would want to, as an architect who's acted as a partner and a project architect at various stages of my life, I would want to be very sure that the person who was looking after this issue was um, experienced enough. Um, and I would want to be satisfied from in discussion with that person that they'd got it right. Could we then look at your report at PHYR 5028, please, at page 62? and go to paragraph 3.8.12 on that page. And let's look at the third line down. I'll, I'll read the whole of it to you because it's only, it's only short. The window head straight concrete floor slab re edge relationship is orthogonal, and therefore the detail is easier, as the following diagram shows. However, and for the same reasons, it is imperative that the cavity barrier is located at the very extreme edge of the cavity, so as to inhibit the entry of fire into the cavity, Superimposed on the diagram is a dotted red line which shows where the cavity barrier should be placed in order to comply with the guidance given under ADB 2 section 9. Again, I have also shown a continuous red line which indicates the position that was shown on the Harley drawings and installed. Now, the diagram that you've set up below that text I've just read to you is figure 3.30. You see that? And we can see the proposed cavity barrier position at the head of the window in the dotted red line. With dotted red. Um, Could we feed the diagram up a little, please? Yes. Yes. So the dotted red, yes, yeah, yeah, so we can probably shrink it a little bit so we can see more of the diagram. Can we do that? that that's enough. Um, the dotted red uh, rectangle there is where you, I think, would put the cavity barrier at the head of the window. Is that right? Yes, as uh, close to the window opening as possible. Yes, and uh, the hard or solid red line is as per the Harley drawings. That is correct. Now, if we look at figure 4.49 of your report um, on page, um, let, well, it's at PHYR 5029. We're in 28 at the moment, which so is flip over to 29 and go to page 66. Uh, we can see here that you have uh, extracted Studio E's drawing 1279091000, showing it that a cavity barrier has been indicated at the window head level. Do you see yes. that? Yes. So that's um, where you, you show that. Um, and, and then if we go to your supplemental report, and I'm sorry to dot around, I need, I need all three together. Um, if you go to PHYS. 505, please. I'm sorry, 605, uh, which is your supplemental report, uh, at page 55, and go to paragraph 6.4.5. You say there, uh, in contrast, Studio E's drawings, as illustrated in figure 4.49, which we've just looked at, showed a cavity barrier arrangement that closed the cavities at the very edge of the openings formed at the head of the windows and were thus compliant with the guidance of ADB2 in this respect, although cavity barriers were not shown uh, around, not shown at the sill and jam positions of the windows. Can you explain, having shown you all of those extracts, can you explain what the purpose of the cavity barrier at the window head was? Yes, could we go back to the previous, the last of the drawings? We the last of the drawings, that's uh, PHYR uh, 5029 at page 66, I think. Is that the one you want? Yes, and could that be um, made a that. little larger? Yes. Perhaps uh, focusing on the top yellow uh, symbol, the top cavity barrier. There you are. Um, 
we can see there that that cavity barrier is at the very bottom of the cavity over the window. It's important to remember here that the cavity over the window spreads from column to column. There are no intermediate parts, but it's, uh, the spandle, I beg your pardon, spreads from column to column, and the rain shield goes from column to column. So the, this condition here is showing the entirety of the um, gap between the two columns. And the requirement is to inhibit the passage of fire into the cavity, where there may be fuel. Certainly, they don't want a fire in the cavity. Placing the, cav the cavity barrier as close to the top of the window as possible means that there is a, a, an obstruction to the free passage of fire at that point, and there is no fuel within the cavity um, to assist a fire. And why does the cavity barrier need to be at the very extreme edge of the window head? At the extreme edge? Well, well as close to the window head as it can, can be. Simply to, so that there is no part of the cavity that is, um, that, that is easily accessed by a fire, um, so that all of, the, all of the cavity and any materials within the cavity are above the cavity barrier, which is protecting them all. Um, let's then look back at your figure 330, at PHYR. But before you leave that figure, Mr. Minute, there's an interesting point on that as it's blown up. Right. May I? Yes. There is a yellow line that we're looking at, uh, a yellow, um, the cavity barrier is shown yellow. There's a dotted line running away from the cavity barrier to the right. Do you see that? Yes. That is the cavity barrier continuing around the column. It then... Uh, meets a vertical dotted line. You can see 575 is written through it. Yes. And there are two lines there. They are the vertical cavity barrier coming down the column. Yes. The dotted line of the horizontal cavity barrier does not continue around the column. Right. It's absolutely key. Yes. So there's your chimney again. Yes. Can we then look at uh, figure 330, which is back at PHYR 5028, please? PHYR 50 is 28 at page 62, which is your, um, I think, indicative position of the cavity barrier. You, 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 we've looked at that a moment ago. Is the position in which you've shown the cavity barrier at the window head the only position which would meet, with the, re meet the requirements of ADB paragraph 9.3, or are there any other positions which would also comply? I, I, no, I think it must be there, as close to the edge of the cavity as possible. Now, we can see from this diagram that in the position shown at figure 330 here, that part of the cavity barrier would not actually abut the concrete floor slab, but, but would abut against the continuous aluminium angle in front of the void. Is, yes. Is that correct? Yes. Now... Mr. Lamb gave some evidence about the efficacy of that arrangement, and I'd like to show you the transcript of what he said and then ask you some questions about that. Could we go, please, to day 38 at page 104? Uh, he uh, says there at line 9, uh, but the window hangs down below the structure. So you wouldn't expect to put a cavity barrier where it can't be backed up by the concrete structure. So for one, you would have to put it at least at the bottom of that concrete floor slab. The second thing, as this is a refurbishment, the concrete isn't crisp and flat and straight as it's shown on that drawing. It's quite a deflection. So the aluminium, this special profile at the head of the window, there would be gaps between that and the concrete. So if it was mounted on that aluminium profile, fire could get behind the cavity barrier and you would also have to contend with the cavity barrier sealing over all the fixings. So that appeared to be the cleanest, safest position. And if, and if we go over the page, to page 105, we can see that uh, Mr. Lamb is then shown your figure 330 by uh, Ms. Grange. And at line uh, 21, uh, Mr. Lamb says, well, as I say, I think he's shown it too low. He is you. He's shown it too low, and he's assuming that the substrate that the 
aluminium angle is bolted to is flat, which it clearly wouldn't be. And then he goes on to say, uh, in line 25, I don't think it should be hanging below the concrete because the fire protection, the rating of the fire product, relies on, the, on a suitable substrate behind it. Uh, and then he goes on at page 106 at line 15, if we can just look at that, to propose a solution. And he says, uh, I think lifting it up, I think lifting it up very slightly would be better. And then another solution would have to be added to that to protect between the aluminium bracket and the concrete also. And then I'm just going to show you some more passages. At page 106, at line 25, he's asked, so just to be clear, are you disagreeing with me that it would have been possible to do what Mr. Hyatt is saying? And he says, it would be possible to do exactly what he's shown, yes. And then at, at page 145, flipping on a number of pages in the transcript of that, please, at line 19, uh, he, he's, uh, he's asked there um, and degraded, had degraded, etc. Did you ever think about whether you could include something different there? Perhaps not mineral wool, but a steel angle. So do you agree with me that approved document B does envisage that other materials could, pro could form proper cavity barriers, including steel? And he answers at line 25, yes, it certainly does. However, if the proposal uh, that we made was acceptable, there's no need for any of that. And then the next page, page 146, at line 3, uh, or line, line, let's say line, line 2, he's asked the question, well, for a, forget for a moment what Studio E did and whether they picked this up, just in terms of your own work. Was it ever considered that there could be a different solution to a cavity barrier in this location? If you were worried about putting something like a siderized cavity barrier in that location, as shown by Mr. Hyatt, was there, any, was there ever any consideration to, for example, putting a metal angle as per section 9 of ADB? And he says uh, at line 10, you could have put a metal angle or a Z section on the inside of the extruded aluminium angle. You see that? And he goes on at line 13 to say, I guess that would be something that could be proposed. Question, yes, but no consideration was ever given to that, not as far as I'm aware. No. Now, I've read you a lot of what he's said and what Ms. Grange put to him about your diagram 330. And I'd just like to understand your opinion about his position as reflected in the evidence I've read to you. Um, can we go back to figure 330, which is the subject of this discussion, PHYR 5028, page 62. And if you need any more of that than, than this, we can look at it. First, do you consider that Mr. Lamb's uh, location of the cavity barrier as shown in the Harley drawing and figure 330, as you've shown it, was acceptable? No. Do you agree that in order for the cavity barrier to be fully effective, its full width should abut a solid surface? Well, excuse me, I beg your pardon. It says position of compartment floor, horizontal cavity barrier. Um, that cavity barrier, to, to meet that requirement, had to be within the depth of the compartment floor. Uh, it, I believe uh, it looks like it's within the depth there, but we found plenty of examples where it's not. It's above the compartment floor. But that's the cavity barrier that's dealing with the compartment floor. If they were to put the cavity barrier higher, that's not immediately over the window opening, but higher, I'm sorry, I'm using my hands to describe this, then that still left a cavity under that cavity barrier that needed to be protected from the window opening. So a second cavity barrier would have had to have been introduced lower down. And then my question, do you agree that in order for the cavity barrier, or a cavity barrier, it, to be fully effective, its full width should abut a solid surface. It's full width, top to bottom. Should uh, yeah, depth. We would use the word depth, depth Mr. Depth, Millett, yes. If you don't mind. No, depth. Depth. Uh, should its full I, depth abut a solid surface? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I qualified the indicative scheme as being one that would form the basis for robust discussions with specialists. Uh, that would be the cavity barrier manufacturer, possibly, certainly Exover, and with building control when the ideas mature, were mature. There may well have been a suggestion that two cavity barriers, one on top of the other, should be used, or a slightly different bracket arrangement. Um, but the cavity barrier 
I think would be uh, would perform well whether fire was attacked attacking the back of it or the front of it or the bottom of it. It's, uh, it's a consistent material all the way through. Um, but as I say, uh, I don't offer it as the absolute definitive solution. It's a, it's a considered proposal for discussion with experts. Uh, if about half of the depth of the cavity barrier doesn't abut a solid substrate, as you've shown in your indicative position with the dotted lines there, but hangs below it, would you consider that that would or might ri uh, risk a compromise of the effectiveness of the cavity barrier? Well, there are two issues there. The first is the, um, the robustness of the fixing. The cavity barrier has to be connected to something that is going to be reliable, and the aluminium may fail. Although, as I say, the evidence is that the aluminium shelf angles we're pretty intact, but um, it's got to be uh, um, a robust fixing. So that would be a consideration. And we're certainly getting very low on the concrete um, to get the kind of the, the, the normal spikes which um, side rise use. They bolt those to the wall and then they um, impale the cavity barrier onto it. So it's, it's certainly getting uh, low for that. So that's an issue that would have to be discussed. The second point that Mr. Lamb made was the, um, the, um, the, the, the lack of um, the fact that the edge of the concrete slab may, may have fissures in it, may wave slightly. Uh, I agree with that concern. Um, but I would point out that, uh, as I showed on Monday, there are some substantial grooves uh, in the concrete um, columns that needed to be filled, and I've showed a way in which that could have been done. Um, I don't think that the, any gap between the back of the cavity barrier as shown here and any unevenness on the spandle panels would have been anything like the size of those grooves. Um, if it did become a concern, and this again is where the, the kind of conversation I've, I've described with specialists would come in, it's possible that the aluminium could have been um, placed onto um, an uh, intumescent strip. It's possible that there may have been conversation about using a steel angle as opposed to aluminium to achieve the, um, the uh, barrier in that way. Uh, it's Mr. possible Hark, I'm, that I'm, a different I'm arrangement cut, could have made. I'm going to cut you off, and I understand all of that. Okay. It's all very useful. Can I just ask you to focus on a, 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 just a very specific point, which is um, I'm just asking you that where, as you can see, about half of the depth of the cavity barrier doesn't abut the solid sub substrate, like the concrete here, but hangs below it. Would that compromise, as designed, would that compromise the effectiveness of the cavity barrier? If would it, it could be securely fixed, um, I don't think so. Right. Why is that? Uh, because the cavity barrier, uh, the back of the cavity barrier, as well as the bottom of the cavity barrier, um, will inhibit the passage of fire. Do you consider the aluminium angle to be a suitable substrate against which to fit the cavity barrier, as you can see is the case in your indicative drawing? Uh, ideally not, um, but uh, the arrangement that I've shown uh, actually um, indicates on one of the drawings somewhere in my report that the, yes, it's, it's a three-dimensional drawing. It shows that the angle would be cut at intervals that's the shelf angle, would, be, would have a slot in it, for want of a better description, at intervals along uh, its uh, length, and that the um, cavity barriers fixing would be directly to the concrete. So, so the cavity barrier is not fixed to the angle. The cavity barrier is fixed to the via its spike. It's impaled on a spike which is bolted straight into the concrete. So would that require modification of the, of the aluminium angle? holding the window in place? Uh, yes, it would have to be cut, but not a difficult task. Right. And let me just look at, see if we can get this clear. Could you go to PHYR 5028, please, at page 77, so on some 15 pages in this document. Let's look at... Oh, there it is. That, that shows it. That's it, yes. That's it. Yep. I see. So those, just to be clear for those watching, those show, do they, the head details... Um, showing the continuous window bracket modified to accommodate the cavity barrier supports. Yes, and please bear in mind this is a cut through it, so it's a section. 
And um, you'll see the second note down, continuous aluminium window bracket. Yes. That continues all the way along the top of the window. Would it be necessary to test whether the cutting into these brackets would compromise the strength or effectiveness of no, the No, it wouldn't be necessary to test that at all. As long as the brackets are bolted to the wall either side of the, um, uh, of the um, spike, which is the uh, thing that the cavity barrier is impaled upon, as long as the brackets are bolted to the wall either side of that, there's no further testing or assessment necessary. And would the result of the cutting into the aluminium angle mean that the back edge of the cavity barrier wouldn't tightly abut the surface against which it's fitted? It would mean that you are correct. My judgment is that um, the the arrangement would be sufficient, but I would want that to be verified by the specialist fire consultant. And if they couldn't verify it, we'd have to find it. And if they could not verify it and satisfy building control, having drawn their attention to it, then we'd have to find a, a, another arrangement. Do you agree with Mr. Lamb uh, with uh, his comment that in respect of your proposed solution, fire could get behind the cavity barrier because the substrate that the aluminium angle is bolted to is not flat because the concrete is not crisp and flat and straight, as he says. I think the, the, the little gaps are going to be so small it would be insignificant. That's my judgment as an architect. Would I, another solution be to use a mineral wool cavity barrier here? A mineral wool ca cavity barrier. Yes. Uh, I, I, no, I think the cavity barrier is correct. Uh, what about mineral wool packing to pack out the gaps, where gaps were left in your solution? Um, well, I, 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 I'm not so worried about the gaps, but uh, if that was to be packed, and it, it's possible it could be a, yet another layer of... Um, protection, then I would um, seek to bolt the aluminium angle onto an, uh, an intumescent mm. strip. Um, so onto the wall goes the strip, onto that goes the angle as you saw, the shelf angle, and then the cavity barrier is fixed directly to the concrete through the slots. Now we talked about this, the aluminium angle here. Um, what about steel? What about the placement of a steel angle at the head of a at the head in order to act as a cavity barrier itself. These are all the sorts of discussions that should have been taking place. And at what point do you think they should have been taking place? Before, um, this is certainly not, a, this is certainly not concept design, so we're not into stage C, we're not into stage D, but we're into stage E and F1 here. So before the documentation, before the employer's requirements documentation was issued, these sort of issues should have been sorted. And a, 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 a switch to a steel shelf angle, not particularly difficult to do, but Harley may well, as well have said we prefer to deal entirely in aluminium. We don't want to be introducing steel for whatever reasons and asked to find another way around it. There are, set, there are a number of ways of solving a problem like this, but the, the time to do it is when there's time and before parties are committed uh, with tender prices. Mm. Um, if the um, steel, if, well, if, if the metal angle was to act as a cavity barrier in itself, uh, w would aluminium as a material be permissible under ADB? Um, no, it's not. The ADB is quite specific, and it's a steel angle. Or, 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 or I think, timber. Yes, and in both cases, I think it, it stipulates the dimensions, the thickness. Right. So, in fact, using an aluminium shelf angle uh, as a cavity barrier itself would be impermissible. Is that your opinion? That's not possible. Um, the reason being that aluminium melts at a lower temperature than steel. Now, and when it comes to examining the solution at stage E or F1, would you expect the reasonably competent architect to have taken the lead in proposing a design solution? Proposing a design solution, possibly not. Ensuring that a design solution is found, yes. And would you expect the reasonably competent architect to have engaged the uh, involvement of building control at that point? 
I would. I don't see building control as part of the design team. I would wish to have my ducks in a row and then go to see building control and say, this is what we're proposing, this is the basis. And what about engaging the client with the question about um, the solution here? Would you expect the reasonably competent architect to go to his client and explain what's going on? I wouldn't expect... Well, the clients that I deal with wouldn't be particularly um, pleased to have me coming and bothering them with issues like this. Right. They'd expect me to design something competently that complied with legislation. Now, we, it now, looks... I, I beg your pardon. Um, that client being, of course, the TMO. Yes. And I'm saying that this should be done at the, during that period of time. Yes. Later on, uh, a design and build contractor may well be interested Yes, thank you. Now, it looks from Mr. Lamb's evidence that we've looked at that he took a decision to move the position of the cavity barriers upwards. We saw that because we compared the extract from mm. the, the Studio E drawing with your figure 330, which showed the actual position of the yes. Harley cavity barrier up, and you illustrated yes. it with your, with your hands. Is that change a design change, which, in your view, should first have been discussed with the architect? by, studio, by um, Harley or by Mr. Lamb? Well, the, the, the protocols for that are that the subcontractor's drawings are passed to the architect for comment. Um, if they've got a good relationship going between them, there may well be a phone call on the way or a sketch sent by uh, email. But certainly at the time that the drawings came through, um, there is an opportunity to comment on it, and that should have been looked at by Studio E. Yes. I, I mean, whether in fact there was or wasn't, is it your opinion that there ought to have been a discussion between Mr. Lamb or Harley and Studio E about the change in the design? Well, the, 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 in my mind, that follows Mr. Lamb ringing up and saying, hey, I think, I'm thinking of changing your cavity, horizontal cavity barrier position over the window. Possibly, possibly not, but it's certainly got to be picked up on the drawing, which he did. He put it on the drawing. Now, let's go to HAR403947, please. This is an email chain in March 2015, as we can see. Uh, and the first email on the page here is one from Ben Bailey to Ray Bailey, attaching some images, and when he says, still going round in circles, and it's copied to Kevin Lamb. But the one I want to show you is the second email in this chain, which is an email from Chris Mort to Ben Bailey of the, of the, day bef of the same day, 30th of March, 2015. Uh, and he says, hi, Ben, I've reviewed the drawing sent over and sketched a proposal to alleviate the issues raised by the BCO, also on the second page of the attachment. I have highlighted a, the weak link, so to speak, in terms of fire, and I think the BCO would also have noticed this. You see that? Yes, yes. Uh, and he goes on to say the proposal requires the installation of RH25 gram 60, 90 straight 60 product in two layers, one at the head of the window aligning with the compartment floor and at the other at the top of the existing upstand, therefore two layers of 60 minutes protection that overall would provide, if tested over 120 minutes, protection at the window locations. Uh, this is just the heads of the windows, is it? Uh, yes. Right. Um, now, I don't think I need the rest of the email for your view about this. I just What I do want to show you is the attachment, which is HAR403948. which is a drawing set. Now, this is the first page of the drawing set where we can see the Studio E drawing. Um, and if we go to, if you look at the right sorry, hand side. I don't think this is a Studio no, this, E you're drawing. You're right. This, this is, no, sorry, this is a Harley drawing. Right. right. You're quite right. If we go to the right hand side of it, you can see that there's a manuscript. And you can yes. see where the cavity barriers are in yes. red. Yes. But I want to focus on the second page of this, if we can. Here we can see uh, that, um, and this is a, a Harley drawing from August 2014, and this is um, revision E of the 3rd of March 2015. Um, here we can see that Chris Mort has put a, a, a squiggle cloud around 
the bracket holding the window in place and has put the words weak link for fire. Do you see that? Yes, and he is from Siderice. And he is from Siderice. Yes. Correct. And you can see the cavity barrier location there illustrated on this Harley drawing. Yep. Uh, do you consider that, that, that there is a weak link for fire in the location identified by Mr Mort? For all the reasons that we've um, been discussing for the last 10 minutes, yes. And why is that? Could you just explain? Uh, because there is um, there's a cavity and there's no protection at the edge of the window in the gap between the window and the concrete. The window here has moved out from the concrete, so out from the face of the building. And my report shows how the previous windows were installed within the line of the concrete. So if you just drop a vertical, if you take the back of the angle, I think everybody understands where the angle is that's fixed to the concrete. If you drop a straight line down, through the window, the, uh, through the opening, the original window position was behind that, that's within the, the, the concrete line. This has gone outside, and it's now created a gap between the top of the window and the concrete. You can see that, and the only filling to that gap, or sealing of that gap, is the aluminium. And the aluminium doesn't satisfy the guidance of ADB2. So there is a weak link for fire, precisely as written here. And beyond that weak link is fuel. Yes, thank you. And the solution uh, that you've identified at figure 3.30 in your report is the solution that you re think ought to have been adopted. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Now, we don't see ourselves any evidence of this email having been forwarded to building control or, or building control being shown this attachment on which the words weak link for fire were indicated at the window head there. That, that's a matter of evidence. My question is, would you expect uh, a reasonably competent architect to raise this question about the potential here for a weak link for fire um, with building control? Do we know if Studio E ever got this? Markup drawing. Uh, no, they didn't, I don't think. Well, my answer then is if they'd have got the marked up drawing without a shadow of a doubt, well, actually, I wouldn't have even bothered to raise it with building control. I'd have sorted it before I went to building control, full stop. Let me ask the question in a slightly different way. Would you expect the reasonable designer, whether it's Studio E or Ryden as the design and build contractor, uh, to uh, have taken this question to building control? There's no point in taking the question to building control because it's a, an unacceptable weak link and a competent architect or designer, planning specialist should know it's a weak link, it's a non-starter. It doesn't matter whether build control, building, actually that's the answer, it doesn't matter whether building control passed it or not, that's the minimum standard, they may have made a mistake. Our job is to comply with the guidance of ADB2 if that's the route we're going, it doesn't comply. So I don't, I, I, even if the building control officer said fine, you do it, I wouldn't do it. Can we then move on and go to PHYR uh, five zero is 28 at page 76. And I want to show you figure 3.38 on that page there. And we can see on the left-hand side of this diagram here that you've indicated a breather membrane. Can you see at the top left-hand side of the um, picture? Yes. The diagram. Uh, it says breather membrane with a pointer arrow with a ball at the end of it identifying where it sits. Uh, and uh, you uh, also say, just four lines down from that, a breather membrane run between cladding bracket and vertical rail and dressed over horizontal cavity barrier. You see that. Yes. Um, does the placement of the membrane passing over the outer edge of the cavity barrier have any impact on the functionality of the cavity barrier itself? I don't believe so. Let me see if I can just explore that. In order for the intumescent strip on the leading edge of the cavity barrier to be able to expand into the cavity, 
Is it right that it shouldn't have any other building components obstructing that expansion against the back of the cladding panel? I, 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 again, these are issues for discussion with the specialists, but I don't think... So the, the power of the expansion of the intermescent strip in, in fire would just push the, the breather membrane straight out and, and, and ram it against the back of um, uh, the surface to which it's seeking to close. So I, I don't think there would have been any issue there at all. I see. So you don't think that the um, existence and location of a breather membrane would have inhibited the expansion of the intumescent? It the certainly end. wouldn't inhibit the expansion. The issue is whether the, the, it, that intumescent strip would expand full stop. Um, I think it would go snugly against the outer surface to which it's intended to reach. I'm in no doubt about that. Can we then turn to uh, Mr. Osborne's evidence? He was Osborne Berry. Day 43, page 97, please. And I'd like to go to line 16. Uh, he uh, says uh, there, and this is in the context of putting an EPDM uh, in in order to seal the angle brackets and to stop water leaking down and into the flats. Uh, and then at line 16, uh, he says, in fact, it starts at line 14, you couldn't penetrate the EPDM with the fire break or the insulation. So the EPDM was put on and then the fire break was moved upwards to allow fitting of the fire break and fitting of the insulation. And then he was then asked, when you say the fire break was moved upwards to allow the fitting of the fire break and fitting of the insulation, do you mean, is this on the columns we're talking about? And he says, no, this is on the horizontal. And if we go on to page 98, at line 6, he's asked the question, does that mean that the positioning of the horizontal cavity barriers on the tower was slightly higher, rose up? You see that? Yes. And to which he answered yes, and then he agreed um, th uh, th that um, they'd been moved up from the position they'd originally been shown in the Harley drawings. You can see that, just from lines 13 and onwards. Um, now... Earlier on in his evidence, Mr. Osborne had explained that a sample panel had been constructed for review. That was, we don't need to see it, but that was page 97 at line 95. Um, moving on from that at page 99, if we can just go back to that, he's asked at line two, uh, oh, he says at line two, he says, very early on in the project, then a sample panel was completed. I believe I was on the mast climber at the time. Graham was on the mast climber and several other people, probably eight or ten people, all came up to have a look at what we'd done, and then that was agreed, and that's, that's where it would be, and that's where we work from, basically. That's what he says. Now, his point is that the uh, cavity barrier had been raised up by about ten centimetres from the position shown in the Harley drawings. And, uh, again, that's page 99 at line 23, the transcript. And he also said that it was either Mr Lamb or Mr Ankertal Jones that had instructed that change, that's page 98, line 24 of the transcript. I've given so, you a huge... Sorry, that's gone up from the position shown on Harley drawings. Uh, yes. So it's gone up even further from the position shown on Studio East drawings. Well, let's perhaps look at page 99, just to be, just to, to be clear, because I'm conscious that I'm now ask, answering your questions rather than the other way around. So I beg your pardon. I can help you. Um, well, it's not surprising. I'm showing you an awful lot of transcript uh, in, in order for you to swallow it in one go. But the answer to your, your question is yes. But let's look at page 99. Um, at page 99, uh, line 23, uh, we, he says 10 centimetres. So that's that. he's given the measurement there. Line 25, approximately how far from the head of the window was... I'm going to go over the page, please. That cavity barrier then, roughly. And he says, I can't remember. Now, um, perhaps it's easier to do this by way of a, of a picture. Uh, Mr. Osborne was shown a photograph, and we can look at that at HAR 401524. Just have that photograph up there. Now, that's a photograph uh, of the building during construction, as we can see. And we can see the cavity barriers in black, uh, horizontal and vertical lines, do you see? Interestingly, you can also see the slots cut out of them 
for the vertical channels that are going to be installed. Yeah, you can. Yeah. That, that's absolutely right. Now, of that photograph, Mr. Osborne um, gave uh, some um, description on page, page 116 uh, of his evidence. If we can just look at that. We can go back to page 116, line 12. Um, he's shown this photograph, and he's asked... Uh, at one six, I'm sorry, one six six, my fault. One six six. He's asked uh, at line twelve. Uh, he, well, line uh, six. He's asked. So in these photographs, we get a sense. I think is that right of how high above the windows those cavity barriers were? Would you agree? Answer: I do. So we can see there that they are further away from the windows than allowed for in the drawings. Answer, correct. Now, I've given you an awful lot to swallow there, Mr. Hyatt, and I'm sorry about that. But do you agree, looking at this photograph and, and the evidence um, that, that I've shown you in the transcript, that the cavity barrier actually installed is higher than the position even as shown on the Harley drawings? I believe that, that well, it looks like it from the photographs, but I have also measured on site uh, sample cavity barriers, and I found them to be higher. Uh, is that a design change which, in your view, should have been discussed with the architect, the lead architect? The, the installation should be as the approved drawings, and any departure from it should be cleared. So yes. And is it your opinion that that uh, change should have been recorded in drawings. When we make changes on site, we sometimes issue a site instruction that might carry a sketch with it, um, and it may not be necessary to go back to change the drawings. But um, the principle of, uh, but the as record drawings should show the correct arrangement. Uh, the as built drawings at the end. Well, I was going to ask you. Yes. If that's what you're going to ask, yes. They, they should be shown correctly on there. Yes, so at some point, whether it's immediately or in production of the as-built drawings, the alteration of the position of the... Should have been recorded. ...horizontal cavity barrier should have been recorded in drawings. Yes, but more to the point, the drawings are there to ensure everybody understands what they're doing and that the building is compliant. A change like that should have been fed back through the architect and back through building control uh, and or ex -over. Would you, in principle, have been uh, supportive of this mock-up construction of the cavity barrier insulation and panel placement that seems to have been undertaken by Osborne Berry on site and then considered by the 10 or 12 people or so who'd seen it? Would you mm. agree with it? Would you support no. It? Why is that? Because it, it's, it, it departs from the architect's drawings it, it would, they should have spotted it departed from um, the Harley drawings, and it departs from ADB2, and there should have been people there who understood the way in which the design was intended to comply with ADB2 and could have said, this is just, a non, this is just not right. Would consideration of the mock-up need to be had by reference to Studio E's drawings included in the employer's requirements? Would you need to put the mock-up next to the employer's requirements drawings and, uh, and consider the former in light of the latter? I haven't quite got the date of the mock-up in my mind. The mock-up is, of course, after the employer's requirements. Was the, um, the mock-up mock done after um, the Harley drawings had been issued? Yes, it was. It was done on site during construction. Well, that takes us back to the comment I made yesterday, which is that the the difference between the architect's drawings and the Harley drawings should have been highlighted, and either the architect's drawings should have been corrected, or there should have been some authority to, to, to depart to the Harley drawings. But either way round, um, if the Harley drawings are by then in currency, there's where the mistake lies. But if they're in currency and the installation of the mock-up doesn't even comply with those, then that should be raised again. I see. So I, I don't, th no, I don't think that the, 
the, the mock-up team would have had one set of drawings from the architects and one set of drawings from Harley. Harley's drawings needed to be right. They were the authority, and it should be checked against them. Uh, and in your view, should Studio E have been involved in reviewing the mock-up? If they're retained, if they're novated, I think they should have wanted to have been there and expressed concern if it was going ahead without them. I think that Ryden should have absolutely wanted them there and shouldn't have contemplated having a mock-up without them there. I don't know whether they were there or not. I think I take it from your last answer but one, that you are of the view that constructing a mock-up of this type uh, took place far too late in the process. And when I say in the process, I mean in the design process. Not, not necessarily. Uh, the the mock-up can have a whole host of useful um, purposes. Um, so I'm thinking back to when we did the, the, the last mock-up I saw was the Oakta Stadium, and we did that just to get a sense of visually what it would look like. Um, yes. We wanted to see it. Th there is no reason why all of these problems couldn't have been sorted out from drawings, and indeed there's every reason why they should have been. So it doesn't need the mock-up to sort out the problem. The fact is that the, the, the mock-up illustrates that they have... Well, the mock-up illustrates that they've misunderstood the drawing and misapplied the drawing. Well, that's really my point, that if you're going to make a change like this, whether through a mock-up or through a drawing, uh, at this stage in the process, it's too late because it's too late to address any issues with the design. Well, they can make a change, but they've got to get the authority for the change. Right. And would that authority include taking formal authority from the, the ultimate client, the TMO in this case, or not? No, because it's a technical issue of compliance. The TMO expect their team to deliver a competent building that's complying with the building regulations. They're not checking their work. The, the team had uh, the responsibility to make sure that it was compliant. Thank you. I now want to turn to a set of questions about the cavity barrier strategy at the jam condition, the jam column condition. You know what I mean by that? I do, yes. yes. Um, can we start by looking at PHYR uh, 5028, please, at page 68? This is figure 3.33 of your report. Typical detail one, jam stroke column interface. And here, am I right in thinking that you have provided a detail, a proposed detail, for the jam stroke column correct. condition, which shows a bespoke yes. shaped corner piece? Yes, that's uh, correct. Uh, uh, and just to be clear for those listening, it's a piece of vertical cavity barrier, which is to be fixed back to the structure via brackets to, fil to fill up fully the residual cavity at the window jam. Yes. And I think you also say that in the alternative, if you couldn't do it that way, then you could fill the residual cavity with mineral wool under compression. Correct. Uh, and we also see uh, a pro well, uh, um, the proprietary vertical cavity barrier fixed to the structure via brackets in this picture, in this diagram, don't we? Yes. Um, if we turn to figure 3.27 on page 54... If, if I may, Mr. Millett, that's in the position that I've shown it as well, that, that um, yes. rectangular one. It's not in the position shown by either Studio E or Harley. No, I understand that. If we go to page 54 for the moment and look at figure 3.27 on that page... Yes. Just to be very clear, we can see the location of the vertical cavity barriers at the window jams on the cross-section of a typical floor here, can't we? Yes. Um, and and could, could you just help us explain by reference to this figure, figure 3.27, um, and figure 3.33 that we looked at, uh, and 3.34 if we need to, why it is that you consider that two vertical cavity barriers per column are necessary? Um, the vertical the, the first point is the vertical cavity, the yellow vertical cavity barriers. Um, are only for the depth of the window. They don't go from floor to floor. They just go from the top to the bottom of the window. Right. And they are necessary to seal the gap between the window frame and the column 
And as you can see, if we take flat three, corner column, there is two junctions of windows to the column. There's a window that uh, is um, on uh, the facade that is between D1 and D2 columns, and the window that is on the facade between D1 and C1. So there's two windows, two sets of windows meeting the column. Each of those junctions need to be sealed um, with a cavity barrier. Yes, and it may be easier to do this by reference to figure 3.34 on page 71 of your report. If we can just turn to that, we may get a, an, e an even clearer illustration of that there. Yes, that is correct. And could you just point <coughs> out to us in that, uh, on that diagram uh, what it is you're proposing there? Well, the, you can see the window. Uh, this is a, a, a plan. So you're looking, so you're looking people down. People may not understand. Yeah, looking as as down through the building. Yes, yeah, as if we've cut a slice through the building Yes. at the window level. And so that slice goes straight through the window. And if you look at the window there, all the little lines denote the various parts of the aluminium window. And then you can see two... Um, Lines moving out to the right of the page, uh, sort of triple lines together. That's the double glazing. Is that clear? Yes, that Everybody? is. Uh, okay. And, just and then the column is on the left. Yes. Um, with the yellow um, surrounds to the grooves that run up the column. So there's the column face coming chamfered to the point of the meets the window and then returning at uh, right angles to the window. And so the inside of the flat is at the top. The outside of the flat is at the bottom. The cavity barrier that's rectangular, you can see the spike dotted as a dotted line. That's been impaled onto that spike, and it is as close to the edge of the cavity as it's possible to put a, 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 a proprietary product that's, that's purchased. There's then a gap, and that gap has to be filled. I believe that it would be possible to persuade um, or to attract cavity barrier suppliers to make special cavity barriers to fill that gap. If not, it would need to be packed with something like mineral wool. And looking at this diagram, do we take it, from what you just told us, uh, that that gap wasn't filled at all on the, as built, on the building as built? Yeah, the model um, the yeah. shows that clearly. That there was no um, filling in there at all. So the gap between the window and the concrete, I'd refer to as being up to 120 millimetres, existed vertically for the height of the window. And then there was a passage straight into the cavity. There was no protection of any sort until the one vertical cavity barrier that did exist on the columns uh, was reached. And that could be right round the other side of the column adjoining the next window. Do you consider that the guidance in approved document B required this gap to be filled in the way that you've identified? It's clear, yes. Could we then just go back to figure 3.33 at page 68 of this report, or this part of your report? Um, we can see um, there... Uh, that, again, there is a breather membrane, you see, uh, yes. on the right-hand column, breather membrane taped and sealed onto EPDM, and then uh, below that on the left-hand side, also at the very bottom, breather membrane uh, identified at the leading yes. edge. Uh, is it the case that the proper functioning of the breather membrane would need an air gap between the corner piece and the cladding looking at the one on the right-hand side. Yes. Uh, and instead of the breather membrane being pressed up against the rear face of the cladding panel, there needs to be a gap. Uh, no, it would, it would fill right the way up to the, to the edge of there. Yes, and is that a problem, given that... Uh, the proper functioning of the breather membrane. No, I, I don't think gap. so. I don't think so. Why not? Because the gap, the the, the the gap is so infinitesimal. Again, these are all issues for discussion as the design develops. But the gap is infinitesimal, so I, I don't think that that's a problem. Right. That may answer my next question, which is this: If this corner piece, as you've designed it, were to be installed in the way you've shown it, 
Um, do you think that it wouldn't fill the entirety of the cavity because of the presence of the membrane and the way that it works? No, it's shown to, to, to fill it pretty tight, tightly. Um, the, the, the main purpose of it is, is at the top where the junction is with the window. It's to stop the passage of fire through there into that zone. I, I'm, as I say, it's an indication for discussion. I, I'm happy that it would form that. Um, there may be refinement to it. Other specialists may have comments. Should the, re should the breather membrane allow water to trickle down the outside face of the membrane? So where you've shown it uh, on the in the gap uh, between the top of the membrane and the uh, the um, the edge of the window, the jam of the window. Water trickling down. Um, there, there, there's going to be damp in that zone, but it's. Um, it it hasn't in my mind, got the same function as the, um, the horizontal cavity barrier uh, gaps behind the main part of the, um, the cassettes. Um, but I, I see where you're going with that. I, I can only say it would need further discussion. Right. I mean, you can, and the point I'm really putting to you is that this is an imperfect design because of the breather membrane and the fact that it would, if it had to be tack, packed tightly, um, it wouldn't allow water to trickle through, and that's a design defect. Possibly, it may be, there may be even discussion about leaving it out. I, I, I would, I would need to take specialist advice on that. I see. Now, of course, this is a bespoke piece, as you've as you've explained. Would you expect a specialist uh, subcontractor to design this element in, in, instead of the reasonably competent architect in the position of Studio E? Mm. The, well, the word there is specialist, the specialist con subcontractor. They, their literature states with confidence their capabilities. Um, amongst those is, of course, installation, and implicitly an installation which is compliant with, um, with code. It's a problem that has to be solved somewhere down the line. I've already said, I think, that at tender stage, the principles should have been resolved. Those principles, I think, should then have been refined by the subcontractor as they move on into fabrication. This is an example of fabrication. Um, alternatively, and this is back to territory of yesterday, if there was something fundamentally wrong, I would hope and expect that the subcontractor picked it up. But um, the intent should have been there on the architect's drawing. The problem should have been identified, and the intent should have been there. There may have been discussion as to exactly how to do it. Would the reasonably competent architect, when, when um, designing through to stage E or F1, uh, have addressed this problem and produced a bespoke solution such as the one that you are recommending? I think. So, so the answer is yes. I did make it clear that tenders can be sought with varying degrees of information at various stages of the process. It would have been possible to have obtained, to have gone out for tenders at the end of stage C or stage D, in which case it would not be there. But the, in this case, the TMO appointed the architect to take the work through uh, at least to the end of F1. On that basis, I believe it should have been there. Thank you. Now, I want to put a countervailing argument to you. Is it possible, would you be of the opinion, that the design of bespoke pieces such as this, if designed in and specified by Studio E at that stage, pre-tender, uh, would you be of the opinion that that would amount to the illegitimate or perhaps undesirable curtailment of the subcontractor's freedom to develop the design? No, because um, the subcontractor can, the, the main, the, the tendering contractor can have amongst the 
the notes for discussion an alternative arrangement and could say, here's our tender, but we wish to discuss the following. Um, or they could raise it without having qualified it at the beginning. Later on, after being appointed, they could say, we're looking at this in a different way. We want to discuss it. So it, it doesn't preclude that. Thank you. Um, I want to turn now to the topic of, um, relating to cavity barriers around the vertical cladding rail, which you have explained to us in your model. Could we start, please, by looking at BLAS 608 at page 57? Now, on that page is a photograph uh, with two rings in it. Can you see that? The I photograph. certainly can, yes. And this is, just to be clear, figure 8.64 from Barbara Lane's report. Yes. And this is a photograph, I think, of the spandrel condition with the column to its right, uh, if you're looking at it from the camera's point of view. And there's a black line down the middle, and that, uh, that's the cladding rail. And if you look inside the blue circle there, you can see the, what I think you called the, uh, the lugs, um, or the bolts on which the cladding panels are to be hooked. Could we use the word toggles? Would toggles that be is the word you use. Toggles. toggles, yeah. And is it right that behind the rail, uh, you can see a quantity of insulation, and below the insulation, you can see the cavity barrier? That is correct. Uh, and that's got a silver top and a black face. And yes. may I draw your attention... If you look at the junction of the, the right-hand part of this, either of the circles, if you look at the junction of the black, which is the channel, with the silver, which is the face of the uh, uh, insulation, you'll see a yellow strip. Yes. That yellow strip is where they have pre-cut into the um, insulation uh, so that the, um, it, fits, it accepts the channels. I showed that on the model when we started on Monday. There's the notches that are cut. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, and that then leaves a gap within the cladding rail, the U-shaped cladding rail, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Now, Mr. Lamb was asked about all of this in his evidence, and particularly whether he considered this gap in the cladding rail. Uh, and let's look and see what he says. It's day 38, please, at page 113. And if we look uh, at the top of the page, uh, Mr. Lamb is asked by Miss Grange at line two, yes, but you've still got the break in the cavity barrier where the rail goes. Do you agree? And then he says at line four, Yes, but the rails are continuous, so there's no alternative. And if you look a little bit further down that page to line 11, uh, he is asked, why didn't you ever give any consideration to the gaps that would be created by the cladding rails as they went through the cavity barriers? Answer, there were no gaps. It was cut tight to the cladding rails. You see, he says that. And then he, he, he is asked... Yes, but the cladding rail itself was a channel through which the cavity barrier did not fit. Does that make sense? It didn't go through the middle of the cladding rail. Yes, the front is yes. And then um, he's asked... Sorry, can I read that again? It's, that's 16. Yes, but the cladding rail itself was a channel through which the cavity barrier did not fit. No, the cavity barrier was cut around the back of the channel. That is correct. Yes? Yeah. Uh, and then... Um, uh, Ms. Grange asks him, we'll come and I'll show you some pictures, and I think in Paul Hyatt's report we get. And sh she's interrupted by Mr. Lamb. He says, I mean, this is normal practice. And then uh, he, uh, she asks him, it's normal practice to cut around the cladding rail. Is that what you're saying? And if we go over the page, he says at line one, that's right, as long as it's tight on the inside, you can do no more on the outside because it's a cladding, it's a continuous joint. Yes. And then she asks, but wouldn't it have been possible to put a piece of cavity barrier inside the U-shape of the cladding rail so that you have a continuous cavity barrier along the spandrel? Answer, but that would be exposed to the outside world then. Question, no, it was inside the rain screen. OK, I think we need to have a look at the detail. Yes, we can do that. Now, um, 
and I'll, again, I'm sorry I'm going to show you some more mouthfuls of this, but let me just do that. If we go to page 151, and let's look at line 7. Ms. Grange asks Mr. Lamb uh, this question. Uh, that's why I'm asking whether anyone ever thought about whether or not that was an unsatisfactory arrangement and that there ought to be some consideration of dealing with that vertical gap through the cavity barrier. And in line 12, he says, in my experience, it's not something that's ever done. You don't fill it with an insulation. But maybe the argument is that the cavity barriers are to stop the spread, the unseen spread of flame. If a flame gets into that black zone, you can see it from between the gaps in all the panels from the outside. Question, really? Answer, yes. Uh, and um, at line 23, I think I can skip over the, the next exchange, uh, he says, all I'm saying is that in my experience it's not normal to try and put a cavity barrier inside that rail. So that's his, that's his oral evidence and his view, having been pressed quite rigorously on it. Um, can we then look at your report at uh, page 28? PHYR 50 is 28, please, at page 80. PHYR 50 is 28, page 80. And here we have figure 3.41, which is typical detail 4, plan through, plan detail through spandrel straight column interface where column aligns with compartment wall. You see that? Yes. And you've got your uh, uh, cladding rail there in the bottom right-hand corner of the diagram. You see that? Yes. And I think you've got a arrow pointed to cladding vertical channel there. As yes, the fourth item correct. The bottom of the and the column. toggle going through it. Yeah, uh, with the toggle going through yes. it, exactly. Or lug, as I think I've wrongly called it. Um, if you um, look at that, um, I, I'm interested in the bottom right-hand drawing there. Um, you can see, I think, a zoomed-in diagram of this on page 81. Just for the inquiry's benefit, this is a, a, a a cut through the building, the, the previous drawing, if you don't mind. Can we just go back to page 80? That is a cut through the building underneath the drawing that we were looking at previously, which was cut through the building at window level. This is cutting through the spandrel panel below the window. Yes, this is exactly. This isn't about the windows. No, very difficult for people to visualize, this is about but that's the where it is. Channels. Yes, so we're, on the ver we're on the topic of the vertical channels, yes. not the window yes. condition. Yes. Going back, if we can, please, to page 81, and look at figure 3.42, um, we can see a close-up, as it were, uh, of the typical cladding joint at spandrel. And you can see that the vertical cladding channel is, is essentially an upside-down U-shape here. And at the very bottom of the diagram, you, is it right that there's an aluminium rain screen cladding depicted there, returning into the vertical cladding channel? It comes in and up, yes? And either side of the channel, there are open state cavity barriers abutting the vertical, uh, vertical cladding channel. You see that? Is that right? Um, yes. Uh, well, where it says horizontal open state cavity barrier, that black dot at the end of that, that line is the intumescent strip at the edge of the cavity barrier, which goes all the way to the top of the picture. Yes. Yes. So cavity barriers would be abutting the cladding rail, as you've shown it, I think. The cavity bar yes. The, the cavity barrier was in, we, we showed it with the model. The cavity barrier is pushed onto the spikes, and it has notches cut out of it to receive the channels, which then fit neatly into the notch. And I do beg your pardon. I, you're going to want to come back to it later. I think I misdescribed the um, the insulation on Dr. Lane's drawing earlier. I won't interrupt now, but we may want to go back to that to just correct that. Oh, well, let's let, let's do it now then, while we have it. Otherwise, if we could have Dr. Lane's it, drawing back up. Get... I, I do apologise. It was a mistake I made. Do you, do you mean Dr. Dr. Lane's photograph? Um, yes. That, that will be B L A. There it is. There it is. Yeah, I, I, uh, it was silly of me. I drew attention to the yellow strip along the edge of the, um, the black channel and said that that's where the insulation has been pre-cut. But it was only the cavity barriers that were pre-cut to receive the channel. As you can see, the, the silver at the bottom of the picture, uh, that silver is, is the, 
is the cavity barrier being cut. And I don't know why that yellow strip exists there at all. Well, I, I was going to ask you about that. Actually, yeah, I'm sorry. I we skipped over it. No, it's interesting. I mean, in fact, is it the case, it looks like the case, that actually the, uh, the yellow strip is, is the exposed uh, PIR or phenolic where the um, person who's cut it has exposed PIR um, behind the silver foil, the aluminium foil facing this being insulation. Actually, I don't know what that is. Well, that's what I'm suggesting to you. I know you didn't take the photograph and weren't there at the time, but that, that, is, that is a possibility that is actually exposed PIR. It doesn't look like PIR to me, actually. It, it looks like um, uh, mineral wool, that top piece of that. So I, I'm not sure what that is there. I've not. I may have seen this photograph before, but I. It looks strange to me. I think that there's further inquiry needed into what that photograph is. Uh, right, but uh, sticking with it, then I think you could. We certainly agree with each other that at the bottom of the, of the rail there is uh, the um, horizontal cavity barrier, with the black face being the intumescent strip. That's correct. Which is um, at, at a horizontal level, overlipped by. Um, a foil, yes? yes. Yes, that is correct. Yes, and, and that, uh, I'm and sorry to have distracted us on the other point. No, that's okay. Well, uh, um, we, we've clarified that, I think. Uh, there may or may not be a mystery about the, the yellow, horiz um, yellow vertical line there. Um, I'm not sure it necessarily matters. Can we then go back to the zoomed in diagram yes. of the vertical channel at page 81 in your report? Yes. PHYR 5028, I think. Yes, there it is. Uh, and, and, and we can see that there. And you show the cavity barriers abutting the cladding rail. Correct. Yes. Now, if, if you were to imagine that the, the cladding panels were not indicated, is it right that there would then be a gap running the entire way down the vertical cladding channel? Yes. The, first of all, the grey, it says light grey indicates the zone that the open state cavity barrier will close up. So I now imagine there's been a fire and the intumescent strip has expanded, and the cavity barrier has come out to touch the back of the cladding. Yes. OK. The pink zone indicates where that intumescent strip would not have gone. It may have strayed a little into the pink, but essentially it's going to go outwards. It certainly won't go round the corner. It, it, the, exactly. the pink being round the corner. We're going to come to the pink in a, okay. in a moment. But, right. but, but am I right in just focusing on my question, that the cladding panels, if they weren't indicated on this drawing, if you took them away, that, that would create a gap running the entire way down the vertical yes. cladding channel. Yes. Th there's a, a, a slot right way up. Yes. Exactly. And that's the gap we saw in the photograph in Dr. Lane's report. Yes. A moment ago. Yes, yes. correct. Good. Now then, um, we can see that the cladding returns into the gap, as you can show. When you fit it, it goes into the gap. And it hooks over the toggle. It hooks over the toggle. Yes. Um, uh, uh, and you've shown a remaining gap, as, and you've called it the residual flanking zone, I think. Yes. That's still a gap. Yes. It? Yes. Now, um, Mr. Lamb offered in his evidence uh, a reason why that gap was not um, uh, addressed, and that, as he says, may have been, because if a flame gets into that gap there, then you can see it from between the gaps in all the panels from the outside. That, that's the, the part of the transcript I showed you. Am I right in thinking that actually you wouldn't be able to see that flame at all? If a flame got into the pink areas, you wouldn't be able to see it from the outside, would you? Or would you? Uh, no, because the, um, the panel uh, conceals it, but you may see flickering shadows of, you know, it's, a flame is a light. So if it was dark, for example, you would see between the returns of the cassettes where they both go back and over the toggle, you would see light coming out from there in the dark. In the daytime, no, you wouldn't see the flame. Right. So to what extent would the uh, gap in which the flames would appear be masked by the cassettes? It would be completely masked if the flames re restricted themselves to just the, the pink. I think they would... Sort of, um, what the flames do, blow, they would blow out in, 
you know, into the area behind the toggle, between the toggle and the channel. Um, but in principle, the, the fire starts within the cassette and cannot be seen. Yes, thank you. M Mr. Chairman, we are um, still in this topic, but it is certainly a convenient moment for the, for the break now, I think. Yes. Um, it, it's, it, it's not a perfect moment in the questions, but it's a perfect moment in the day. I think it is, isn't it, Mr. Hyatt? I think we ought to have a break now. So we'll stop now for lunch. If everybody else would like a break, I'll certainly fall in. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we'll all have one. We'll, um, we'll stop now. We'll resume at 10 past two, please. Thank you. And again, please don't talk to anyone about no, your won't. evidence when you're out of the room. All right? Thank you very much. Ten past two, please.